Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, for this first in a two-part series uh, called Paving the Way to a Hydrogen Economy, um, being co-hosted with uh, Ora Carrington and Sutcliffe. Uh, my name is Alex Krauka, and I am a Seattle-based consultant for the U.S. Energy Association's Consensus Program. Uh, for those of you who may not know, uh, the consensus program uh, is a cooperative agreement with the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management that seeks to educate the public, policymakers, industry, and other stakeholders uh, to build a consensus on the benefits of and requirements for carbon capture, use, and storage, as well as other carbon management technologies, uh, such as hydrogen, uh, which we will be discussing over the next two days. Uh, we do this through a variety of, of methods, uh, such as briefings uh, and webinars, such as today's um, workshops that, that we'll hold usually on a, on a monthly to quarterly basis. Uh, we'll put out a series of reports throughout the years, and then we also have a monthly news clips uh, that we use to, to help keep our stakeholders informed. Um, if you are not already on our on our mailing list, please feel free to email my colleague Michelle Littlefield at mlittlefield at usca.org. Um, so we have a packed program today. Uh, really, really fantastic. Really excited um, to to have this. Um, following a, a my spiel, um, we'll have Oryx uh, Peter Connors uh, give a few introductory remarks. Um, he's really the, the brains behind uh, this, this webinar series. So, so thank you, Peter, um, for, for um, allowing us to, to co-host this with you and, and putting together so, such a great list of panelists. Um, Peter will be followed by a keynote address from uh, USCA's Acting Executive Director, Sheila Hollis. Um, and then we'll go in, into uh, uh, panels um, one and two, looking at the national strategy for hydrogen, and then the role of electrolysis in, in developing low low carbon hydrogen. Um, be, before we move move on to Peter, I just uh, wanted to to kind of set the stage real quick for those um, who are maybe a little bit newer uh, to to the hydrogen space. Um, you know why why hydrogen? Uh, and and a big big. Uh, reason for it is that it's another tool for, for decarbonization um, and particularly for, for de, the hard to decarbonize sectors such as uh, aviation fuel, uh, fuel for, for maritime shipping, long haul transportation uh, can be used in manufacturing processes such as steel production and, and chemicals manufacturing. Um, and it can also be an alternative to, to kind of more traditional battery storage um, and electric vehicles reliant on, on rare earth elements and, and critical minerals. Um, many may be familiar kind of with, with the dangers on, on relying on foreign sources of these uh, materials. Um, and many are familiar with the potential for environmental da damage from mining for, for rare earths and critical minerals. Um, so in the name of limiting a global environmental problem, you're maybe substituting a local one. Um, and then additionally, you have the many foreign policy implications um, with, with regards to rare earths and critical minerals. Um, so hydrogen can, can really be a more environmentally friendly substitute in, in some of these cases, uh, both from a climate perspective and, and a local environmental perspective, as well as um, being without the reliance on, on foreign adversaries for, for its success. Um, you may also hear about the different colors in relation to hydrogen. Um, so generally green refers to hydrogen produced with renewables, uh, blue refers to hydrogen produced with, with fossil fuels and, and carbon capture uh, systems in, incorporated um, to, to capture those CO2 emissions from, from the production process. Um, you, you may also hear pink in, in relation to hydrogen produced from uh, nuclear um, as well as, as black and brown um, or, or gray. Uh, referring to hydrogen produced from fossil fuels uh, without carbon capture. Um, and so that the, the color codes sometimes can be a bit confusing. However, they do allow for, for a more nuanced discussion, um, but, but it also helps sometimes to just simplify it and, and think of, of clean hydrogen, uh, in, in which case uh, you have zero to, to low emissions of, of CO2 in the production process. So with that, just wanted to um, set the stage a little bit. Um, now I'm going to pass it over to Peter Connors uh, from Oryx to, to give a bit more of an introduction to, to um, the concept for this webinar series um, and, and his involvement. 
with that, Peter, go ahead and unmute yourself and, and the floor is yours. Okay. Um, well, Alex, thank you very much for that very robust introduction. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our webinar on paving the way to a hydrogen economy. It's a second webinar that Mike Moore and I have organized on this topic for the USEA. Uh, unfortunately, Mike is ill today, so he can't join us. He's been involved in the planning for this program for the last two months, and it's really unfortunate that he's ill today. So, um, Mike, I uh, hope you feel better soon. Uh, now, over the next two days, uh, we have four panels that I think everybody will find interesting, at least certain parts of the uh, program. Uh, there's almost something here for everybody. Uh, on day one, which is today, Frank Wolak from Pachia will lead a panel discussion on the national strategy for hydrogen, which is a comp key component of the bipartisan infrastructure bill, or the bill, um, as the folks at DOE call it. Then Mark uh, Roth from NREL will lead a panel on the role of electrolysis in propelling the hydrogen economy. And we picked electrolysis as a topic because uh, there are specific position provisions in the bill related to clean hydrogen. And there's a, a billion dollars allocated to the program. And today we'll wrap up today's uh, uh, discussion with a Q&A where all the panelists will participate. So please send in your questions using the Q&A function. We're not gonna take questions during the sessions. We'll get to those uh, during the Q&A session. And then looking uh, to tomorrow, uh, day two, uh, Chuck McConnell, who is a, a former assistant secretary of DOE, will kick off the discussion with a keynote address. And, and those of you that know Chuck uh, will also know that um, he is quite an interesting speaker. So that, that keynote address is going to be very interesting. And then Chuck will lead a panel um, with um, professionals from uh, Baker Botts on the hydrogen economy evolution. And then finally, we'll wrap up the day with a panel on tax incentives. And I'm sure that's um, a panel that's gonna uh, be very interesting given what has happened over the weekend. So um, I, I'd like to just uh, turn, uh, that concludes my remarks. And I'd like to just turn the uh, podium over to Sheila Hollis, who's the acting executive director of the United States Energy Association. Sheila? Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. And uh, a very special thanks to Alex, too, for his uh, tremendous organizational uh, uh, initiative and uh, organization. Uh, I, too, miss Michael Moore. He's been a longtime friend uh, and uh, wish he could join us today. Uh, with respect to uh, what USEA is and why it's uh, involved in this, uh, we are uh, about a hundred year old organization. Uh, we have two major uh, uh, directives. One is to convene a la what we're doing today to convene and educate uh, all players in the energy arena and those affected by energy. Uh, and on the second side uh, of our obligations is uh, work all over the world. We've worked in 104 countries, all pursuant to USAID, the Department of Energy, uh, and the Department and uh, the Department of Interior uh, and the Department of State uh, worldwide. And uh, we really began this after the fall of the wall. Uh, and uh, in those 104 countries, we have made and are continuing to make a big difference. Uh, whether it's uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, former Soviet Union countries, uh, South America, Central America, uh, Af uh, very, very extensively in Africa and throughout uh, various parts of Asia as well. Uh, we have uh, a modest sized staff, but we work uh, with uh, uh, the State Department, DOE, uh, and uh, USAID, uh, and a variety of consultants, uh, domestic and international. Uh, many of the utilities that belong to USEA have worked worldwide uh, uh, to donate their time and their people to various initiatives. Uh, throughout the world. And in many cases, the individuals who were involved became so involved that they continued on and did so on their own nickel. Uh, and that's a key part of our wonderful USEA community as well. 
for nonpartisan, non-lobbying, a very unique organization. Uh, and basically, we're here to educate, inform, and to help the world uh, obtain energy supply. It's, uh, we view it as basically a human right. Energy never sleeps. Uh, energy is needed. Uh, the world needs it now more than ever, as we've seen demonstrated in uh, recent weeks. And certainly, the hydrogen economy is going to play a critical role uh, now and into the future uh, to solve multiple uh, problems and multiple multiple uh, challenges. And uh, that's why USEA is here, and that's why uh, the Department of Energy is supporting it, and why USEA is helping to implement that, along with uh, Peter and his uh, fine team. Uh, Michael, we regret, has, he is not here, but he has put heart and soul into this uh, for many months as well. So we're honored to have the tremendous speakers that we have here. Uh, thrilled to get to know you and thrilled to learn more uh, about this remarkable initiative and look forward. Uh, for those of you who are interested in USEA, take a look at our website, uh, see some of the programs we have coming up and some of those that have been uh, recorded over the past uh, COVID uh, shutdown months. Um, and uh, there's, it covers just about all there is to say and do on energy, including cybersecurity and the like. You'll find it's very cutting edge. Uh, and we've had major press conferences as well that also have provided uh, a, a lot of information on cutting edge topics as well. So it's an honor to join you today and please, uh, please proceed, uh, Peter. Uh, and uh, our team uh, on, on the screen now, really looking forward to learning more with the intense detail that only you can provide. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sheila. So our first panel will be on the national strategy for hydrogen, and it will be led uh, by uh, Frank Wolak. Um, and Frank is the president and CEO of the Washington-based uh, Fuel Cell and Energy, uh, Hydrogen Energy Association, FICHIA. Um, an organization that represents over 70 leading international domestic companies and organizations that are advancing innovative, clean, safe, and reliable energy technologies. And prior to joining Fichia, Frank was the Senior Vice President at Fuel Cell Energy, Inc. Um, and at Fuel Cell Energy, uh, Frank initiated and developed very innovative and uh, uh, fuel cell technology applications. Um, and he has worked closely with the Department of Energy, Congress, and state energies to define and sustain programs for hydrogen and fuel cells throughout the U.S. So, Frank, I'm going to turn the podium over to you. Sure. Thank you, Peter. Um, I want to just thank the USEA and the um, uh, ORIC team for the privilege of helping set up this webinar. It was a lot of work, Peter, but I think we've got a great uh, uh, cast of participants for the next couple of days. And... Um, I'll start here with a bit of a screen share. As Peter introduced, uh, FCHEA is the leading industry association for fuel cells and hydrogen in the United States. We have been advocating for hydrogen for over 30 years. We have over 70 members and uh, are advancing innovative, clean, reliable energy technologies. Uh, a cornerstone of what we do is to drive support and provide a consistent industry voice to regulators and policymakers. And our members range from vehicle manufacturers, fuel cell and hydrogen technology providers, leaders in the production and delivery of hydrogen, innovators in aviation, transportation, and power applications for hydrogen and fuel cells, and overall organizations with a passionate interest in advancing hydrogen in the United States. I am privilege today to moderate a really unique panel on the subject of hydrogen uh, strategy. The format for the session will be a modified talk show with two subject leaders, Chris Gregg and Sanjay Shrestha. Chris and uh, Sanjay's bios are in the USEA uh, web um, uh, materials on the site. But briefly, um, Dr. Gregg is the Theodore and William Walton Senior Research Scientist at Princeton University's Andegar Center for the Energy and Environment. His academic career follows almost three decades in industry across a broad range of resource and energy sector roles at senior executive level and as a non-executive director. At Princeton, Chris spearheads the Rapid Switch Initiative at the Anlinger Center. His research combines engineering, business, and social sciences to explore the challenges of rapid decarbonization for different regions and sectors. Sanjay Shrestha is the General Manager, Energy Solutions, and Chief Strategy Officer at Plug Power. Sanjay joined Plug as its chief strategy officer in 2019. Prior to joining Plug, 
Asanjay served as the chief investment officer for a global solar IPP and president of Sky Capital Americas. Sky Capital built and acquired over 100 megawatts of operating solar assets. He also brings almost two decades of experience in the broader clean tech sector. Before uh, the global uh, solar IPP, he had led the renewables investment banking effort at FBR Capital Markets. Prior to FBR, Mr. Shrestha spent seven years as the global head of renewables research at Lazard Capital Markets. And uh, prior to Lazard, uh, Mr. Shrestha spent seven years at First Albany Capital. Deep experience in strategy and capital markets. I'm going to, um, before we jump into the details of this, I wanted to sort of set the tone here for the, um, the, the background. Um, these are, what's on the next two slides are really for a backdrop to, to set the stage for the questions we will have with the, with the panelists. Uh, and uh, I think these, these points are, are clear. Decarbonization is here to stay. Uh, we are all in a time of change, opportunity, some uncharted waters, and overall strong societal demands for action on the subject of decarbonization. Hydrogen has a vital role to play in the energy transition. The bullets that follow are, are not um, detailed, but certainly the discussion around COP26 has challenged the US and the world. Uh, the impacts of climate change are getting clearer every day. The US has put policy action and dollars to impact hydrogen in a meaningful way. And US and international entities are gearing up to participate in this challenge. There's some themes here that are gonna guide some of the questions and answers among our panel. There is significant policy planning going on, the hydrogen shot and efforts of the US DOE to define what Congress has asked them to do for US, US roadmap. There's stimulus uh, in the form of the infrastructure bill and tax policies being considered by Congress. There's momentum. Uh, there's worldwide efforts will challenge the US to take action. The US does not like to be second. Capital. There are huge requirements for investment. Uh, some of those will be pointed out in Chris's presentation. There's also a need for scale. Uh, moving hydrogen forward is gonna require a least cost and low carbon uh, product and uh, scale is needed to achieve those goals. And I think the other thing to keep in mind as we go through the next couple of days here is timing. Much of the conversation around hydrogen or even decarbonization has an index of 2050 with starting points that appear to be 2025, 2030. But 2050 is not that far away. When you consider the time it takes to deploy, to ramp, to achieve results, to convert, um, we've got a lot of work ahead of us. And I am absolutely pleased to have um, two very strategic uh, uh, members of my panel, a key researcher at the forefront of energy analytics and a corporate strategist in a leading company in the hydrogen space guide us through some of the questions that I will, we will ask. Now with that, um, I wanted to uh, turn this over to Chris. Uh, Chris is, uh, what, what Princeton has done with the net zero America uh, scope here has in fact taken simplistic, or I'm sorry, very complex issues and tried to distill them with very detailed analytics, very thorough report working to try to guide policymakers into uh, options. And I won't get into the details of what's in the, uh, in the report because Chris will cover it, but there are five um, key areas that, that, and, and case studies that have emerged, uh, all guiding a path toward decarbonization with various factors. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chris and uh, he can give you some summary of that uh, report. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Frank. And uh, thanks to USCA for this opportunity to participate in the discussion. Uh, so, as Frank mentioned, I'm going to frame my remarks around the Princeton Net Zero America study you know, with the objective of really trying to understand what it would take to deliver on the hydrogen economy ambition that evolves in the mid-century transition to a net zero world. I'm going to frame my remarks around three key parts. Uh, first, about the Net Zero Challenge. So, I'll give a quick overview of the, of the Net Zero America study, how we went about framing the pathways, how we developed them and how we downscaled them. And I'll provide some high level characteristics of these different pathways. Now, this is a skim across the top. It's, you know, almost 20 person years of work. So a 10 minutes synopsis is uh, obviously going to be brief. Second, 
I'll drill into the role that clean hydrogen plays in the various pathways, how the demand for clean hydrogen evolves over time in terms of sectors and end uses, and how production evolves over time. And finally, I'd like to frame the clean hydrogen economy challenge and the critical issues that I think we must navigate if we're going to turn that ambition into a reality. Okay, so let's recap the Net Zero America study. So there are many potential pathways to net zero, um, but essentially all leverage six key pillars of decarbonisation. The first is improving energy productivity, which we achieve with the combination of energy efficiency and electrification of end uses, especially in road transport and space heating. Second is clean electricity generation by deploying wind and solar, but also clean firm generation based on fossil fuel combustion with CCS, biopower, hydropower, nuclear, but along with electricity storage and transmission infrastructure. The third pillar is clean fuels production. And here is where hydrogen features prominently, along with biofuels and fissure tropped fuels for, with CCS. Fourth is carbon capture and, or CO2 capture utilisation and storage coupled to bioenergy, fossil fuel utilisation or cement plants, for example. And those four comprise the energy and industrial sectors. The fifth pillar is reducing non-CO2 emissions like methane and nitrous oxides from agriculture, waste and fossil fuel infrastructure leakage. And then finally, we increase the natural land sinks through forestation and other vegetative land management. Now, to generate our net zero pathways, we used a suite of macro scale energy systems models, which essentially optimise the net present cost of the transition based on a huge number of assumptions and constraints regarding the uptake, performance and cost of different technologies. And these models also benefit from perfect foresight and seamless integration between sectors, which of course is very idealized representation of the real world in which investors make decisions. So we decided to explore five pathways, which would bounce around between the uncertainties and the different constraints and allow for different assumptions. And none of the pathways are what we expect to become reality. But what we aim to do was to more or less span the range of plausible pathways that might get you to net zero. The other thing worth mentioning is that each pathway follows a linear trajectory. So from, from where we are today to, to net zero in 2050. Now, two of the pathways highlight different demand scenarios in which the uptake of end use electrification while Leaving that while well, we leave the supply side unconstrained in cost optimization. So one sees almost entirely electrification of uh, road transport, light duty vehicles in particular, and, uh, and heat, uh, whereas another one is a much more modest uptake of electric cars, for example. The other three choose a particular end use scenario and highlight different supply side path pathways. For example, one features an ex a significant expansion of biomass. Another focuses only on renewable energy and phases out all nuclear and fossil use by, by 2050. And finally, our fifth pathway looked at a case in which net annual capacity addition of new wind and solar was capped at 30% more than the historical annual record deployment, but that, that, that new hit record is maintained year on year for the next 28 years. Now, we didn't and don't have a preference among these pathways. What we wanted to understand was the critical issues for success in one or more. And in our narrative, we consider the best pathway to net zero is the one you can actually get done given political realities, societal attitudes and capital allocation preferences of investors. Now, having run the models, we then did something which was more or less a first. We, we downscaled these pathways with high resolution. Now, what that means is we essentially located and mapped more or less at zip code level, the tens of thousands of individual assets that need to be built over time, considering around 60 real world siting criteria. Now, this helps reveal really important insights about the scale and speed of the deployment challenge, the impacts on landscapes and natural resources, implications for communities, costs and capital flows, and the plight of incumbent industries. 
Now, what we find is that all pathways rely on extraordinary deployment of technology and infrastructure at unprecedented speed. So to give you a couple of features of these, in a scenario which I'd call middle of the road on the supply side, it calls for 1.5 terawatts each of new wind and solar by 2050, plus a threefold expansion of transmission, plus a thousand new bioenergy plants, plus a billion tonnes per annum of CO2 being injected into the subsurface in 2050. It requires more than $10 trillion to be spent on the supply side and $2.7 trillion by 2030. Much, much more than that happens on the, on the demand side. Now, we also find that all of these pathways are vulnerable to a range of different deployment obstacles and local, locally specific bottlenecks and trade-off decisions. So, so the key message is that none of these pathways are easy. They are unprecedented in what they're going to take. So now let's dive into the role of hydrogen in the pathways. So all of these net zero pathways involve the deployment and rapid expansion of clean hydrogen value chains. For example, among the five scenarios, clean hydrogen production grows to between eight and 20 times current hydrogen production levels, from approximately 10 million tonnes per year to between 60 and 130 million tonnes a year of hydrogen by 2050, depending on which pathway. On the demand side today, hydrogen consumption is dominated by the petrochemical sector and supply is dominated by captive steam reforming uh, facilities in which grey hydrogen is produced from natural gas. That grey hydrogen is emissions intensive with at least nine tonnes of CO2 produced for every tonne of hydrogen. Now going forward, that demand diversifies to include hydrogen fuel cells for medium and heavy duty vehicles, possibly light duty vehicles, direct reduction of iron ore for steel making as a key input to the production of synthetic liquid and gaseous fuels for things like uh, aviation, maritime, and even uh, feedstocks for chemical industry, to fuel combustion turbines in the power sector to help balance renewables, and for steam raising to provide heat. The mix depends on the pathway being followed. On the supply side, Clean hydrogen relies in our scenarios on a mix of three technologies with the mix again depending on pathway. Four of the pathways feature some amount of blue hydrogen produced by autothermal reforming of natural gas coupled with CCUS. All five pathways feature significant what we called emerald hydrogen produced by gasifying sustainable biomass, again coupled with CCUS. CCUS. This option has special value in the net zero pathways because it produces clean hydrogen with net negative emissions. And finally, all pathways feature significant green hydrogen produced by electrolysis of water powered by clean electricity. The clean electricity is dominated by renewables, but, um, but we didn't distinguish between pink and green. Now, with the cost assumptions in the net zero America study, the blue and the emerald hydrogen options start out at a lower cost than green hydrogen and dominate the supply in the first 15 years. But, and of course, during those first 10 to 15 years, the grid is still decarbonising. But as the cost of electrolysers falls quite rapidly, green hydrogen becomes competitive and indeed the lowest cost option later in the second half of the transition. And by then the electricity grid is actually zero carbon and so the green hydrogen plays a dominant role in that second half of the transition. So now I'd like to frame the challenge of developing what is, I think, a, a truly ambitious clean hydrogen economy. So at a macro scale, we might consider the development in our pathways as following two phases. First, we decarbonise existing hydrogen supplies to the petrochemical industry during the first decade or so. And then we expand clean hydrogen supplies and end use demands by an order of magnitude at least between 2030 and 2050. As someone who spent most of my career developing large scale energy production and industrial assets, 
Uh, I spend most of, my most of my time thinking about how to turn the ambition of what we model in pathways into a reality. And I tend to be pretty pragmatic when I look at where we're starting from. So here in the US, and in fact globally, there is no significant supply of clean hydrogen, no significant demand for clean hydrogen, and no enabling infrastructure to connect future supplies to future end uses today. And the expansion of this future clean hydrogen economy is characterised by what I would call deep uncertainty. So future expectations for supply technologies and costs along with the adoption rates for various end uses are both uncertain. And here comes the critical issue. Given the speed and scale of expansion of clean hydrogen production and use, which is called for in our net zero pathways, I think we have a classic chicken or egg challenge in which investors in new clean energy, a clean hydrogen supply will be hesitant to invest without a high level of confidence in demand which probably needs to be underpinned by contracted off takes or investors in clean hydrogen demand, that is the emerging end use markets, will be hesitant to invest without a high level of confidence in reliable, competitive clean hydrogen supplies. And investors in infrastructure, for example, pipelines, refueling stations, storage, et cetera, will be hesitant to invest without a high level of confidence in a threshold of users suppliers and buyers of clean hydrogen. Now, to be clear, I'm, I'm bullish on hydrogen. Clean hydrogen demand will expand and investments will likely be made in clean hydrogen production projects. But I think it's this speed and scale of those investments that is unlikely to match what's needed to achieve net zero by 2050. So in other words, failure to resolve these chicken and egg dilemmas risk seeing a gradual expansion of clean hydrogen value chains in ecosystems and therefore a shortfall in emissions reduction. So I'm going to close with a challenge to every panel member over the next two days. Think speed and scale. Paving the way to a clean hydrogen economy that is large enough in 2050 to support the net zero emissions ambitions of our country must resolve this chicken or egg dilemma. Uh, and so thank you for listening and back to you, Frank. Thank you, Chris. I appreciated the comments. Um, and that report uh, is deep, thorough, and a good read. Uh, for those who have the time, you can download it. Um, and speed and uh, scale, Sanjay, sounds like exactly the kind of questions you wanted to tee up. So I'll give you the floor for your introduction um, uh, and go right ahead. Well, thank you, Frank and uh, Chris. Uh, by the way, again, as Frank said, what a thorough report. I thoroughly enjoyed the report as well. well what a great work there. Um, again, I think uh, what you said about speed and skill, I think uh, that is all we think about at Plug Power, right? And I think uh, I couldn't have said it better. That is really what it takes for us to think about this energy transition and hydrogen have to you know, garner the role that it has a potential to. Right? But before I go to that, let me take a step back and maybe just uh, for everybody's benefit, talk a bit about Plug Power. Right? So Plug has been around for about 20 years, right? and we take a lot of pride in the fact that we really created a first viable and a very large commercial market for hydrogen fuel cell. How did we do that? We actually, rather than trying to tackle a lot of different markets, go after a lot of different industries, we tackled, I think, Chris, the key point that you brought up, which is chicken or the egg. Right? It's always about, do I build the infrastructure? Do I get the hydrogen there? Or do I actually have the fuel cell product there? Right? So we went after this poor market of material handling where you had a lot of captive forklifts right, of running some mission critical application. As a matter of fact, during COVID pandemic in 2019 and 2020, our product were moving about 25% of the retail food here in the US with this forklifts. Right? So we were able to then leverage the cost of that infrastructure. We were able to bring hydrogen to the site. So from a customer perspective, we were able to provide that one-stop turnkey solution. Net result really took off in 2014 as our CEO, Andy, thought about this is the market. We got to go deep. We got to get first app and first market right. Fast forward till now, you know, that business have gone from about 17 million, not quite the trillion numbers that we're talking about here, 
but from 17 million in revenue to now this year, we'll do about $500 million in revenue. And we're talking about doing as plug 3 billion in revenue by 2025. Now with that, what has that allowed us to do is basically become deeper in the, not just in the fuel cell application side, but also in the hydrogen business, right? And in 2019, we made a strategic decision that we're gonna basically start to have bigger control of the hydrogen fuel as well, rather than just buying from the third party supplier. Why is that critical? Again, it goes back to availability of the fuel and more importantly, making green hydrogen economical and ubiquitous. So that's never ever anybody worries about embracing, adopting and rolling out new fuel cell application because they're concerned where the hydrogen comes from. So what, the, what did we do about that? In 2019, we made a conscious decision of going from low carbon to zero carbon hydrogen solution. And in 2020, we made two fundamental acquisitions. One is of an electrolyzer company, Geiner ELX, right? Which allowed us to really leverage renewables, build megawatt scale product, and then generate green hydrogen. We also bought a company called United Hydrogen in 2020, the only private company that has successfully built large scale liquefaction capability outside of the industrial gas company. That also brought us a lot of logistics know-how put that business together, now we can really think about low cost renewable, reducing green hydrogen, liquefying green hydrogen, and being able to transfer that to a variety of different markets. And then in 2021, we said, okay, so we're gonna go ahead and really expand the build out of this green hydrogen in North America, go from less than 10 tons a day of capacity today to 500 tons a day by 2025. And by the way, that 500 tons just is a number at a point. That's not where we're going to stop. The demand is bigger, scale has to be larger, and we're going to keep growing. And when you think about not just the US and think Europe, we're going to do about 1,000 tons of green hydrogen generation by 2028. Now, to complement all the work we're doing, given that hydrogen and energy is a global business, in 2021, we struck a lot of partnership. We did a lot of joint ventures. One of them would be joint venture with Renault, which is a new you know, new entity called Hyvia with Plug and Renault now making light commercial fuel cell electric vehicles serving the European market. We're working finalizing our JV with Fortescue in Australia. We just formalized our partnership with Axiona to produce green hydrogen in Europe. And we're also working on finalizing our partnership with SK Group, you know, to actually have a presence in Asian market starting out with South Korea. So we've taken our success in this first market, you know, from North America, increased and our presence in the green hydrogen business, taken this on a global basis. And we feel like we built this platform. And the reason this platform creation was important is exactly the point you made. It's about speed and scale. And it's about really getting the cost of green hydrogen down right and really making sure that we can execute on this growth needs. Because I think this is what's exciting about it, right? So when you really start to think about green hydrogen, this is a perfect way to decarbonize the electric grid because we got a lot of renewables in the grid, right? Once you do that, then there is some grid stability related issue going back to your point of how do you think about some of the other generation source that allows you to keep grid stable? Think about pipeline infrastructure for hydrogen. Think about long duration storage for hydrogen. Think about fuel cell actually being a solution from a peak power perspective. And then layer that on with all the new apps, right? Material handling, on-road vehicle, light commercial vehicle, middle mile vehicle, long haul trucking, stationary power, data center, and also thinking about decarbonizing the industrial economy of you know, refining industry, ammonia industry, other manufacturing entities, right? So to be able to do this, you know, we've obviously gone out and raised quite a bit of capital as well, right? And uh, we now are sitting with about $5 billion of cash to execute on the strategy. Again, not a number that's going to be able to execute on all this trillions of dollars of capital, but obviously that's why I think the role of the government, some of the policy initiatives that we're talking about, I think are super critical to make hydrogen equally a bankable asset class, like how we feel today about solar and wind. Once you can get to that point, access to capital becomes easier and easier to really help propel the growth of this industry, which Chris, as you said, we cannot afford to get wrong. So, um, so Frank, with that, maybe I can turn it back to you, sir. Sanjay, uh, thank you. And uh, clearly plugs 
uh, activities over the past two decades are really a benchmark for the way other companies have to go to market and address these factors. We're going to take a bit of a cut over here for a moment because Alex, uh, we, we're, we're going to have a poll question put up. Alex, perhaps you can uh, cut in here and uh, insert the poll question to the audience. I have put up the poll. Can you see it, Frank? I can see it fine. Okay, perfect. Just let us know when um, you feel this is completed, Alex. We'll give it a, about 10 more seconds here and then uh, cut it. All right, looks like everyone who intended to answer has had a chance to, so go ahead and share these results. There you go. Hmm. Interesting outcome. Well, actually, as we talk this, some of the question and answer, um, uh, the subject of Hydrogen Hub is going to be part of this. Uh, it, it's a cornerstone to what the US DOE is doing. I'm gonna start with a few questions and I might as well start with the, um, the subject of, of hydrogen hubs. The DOE roadmap that is um, being uh, required by Congress and, and undertaken by the Department of Energy will outline a plan for massive increase in hydrogen use. A cornerstone of that plan is the development of several hydrogen hubs. And I'm gonna put this out to uh, perhaps Sanjay first and then I'll go to Chris because the questions are slightly different. Sanjay, do you believe the hubs will jumpstart the diversity of applications and investment required? I mean, Frank, short answer is absolutely yes. Right? I think it's an excellent program. And I think we should just get it going. We should get it going, right? We should just start to spend the dollars. Let's move. I mean, I think we are plugged. We're ready, right? So uh, we can actually have one of the locations where we're building a large green hydrogen plant where we also have our gigafactory, right? Be potentially a part of this hub. So a uh, couple of things, Frank, right? I mean, I think what this will do is uh, obviously this will allow you to also think through many different ways of transporting hydrogen, storing hydrogen, and use application, right? So this capital, I think, will be very, very well spent. One, of course, to drive the cost of green hydrogen down even faster, right? Above and beyond some of the effort we've taken to make sure we're trying to locate these plants where we can get the lowest possible renewable electricity, right? Second piece out of this is, this is gonna create a tremendous amount of job, right? Just think about how the paying job that we're looking to have at this green hydrogen plants. And these are jobs that will stay there for a long time, right? You know, whether it's an operator of the plant, and these are really high paying jobs for plant operator, technicians, engineers, variety of different areas. and. By the way, just to put some numbers in context here, Frank, right? Every 15 ton a day, and I'm not even going million tons number here, Chris, right? Every 15 ton a day plant will have about, you know, basically call it about, you know, essentially we'll have seven trucks. Therefore, you're going to need about a team of 10 drivers, which is 20 drivers. You will need another 20 folks permanently to operate those plants. That's 40 jobs for just a 15 ton plant, right? And our plant in New York is about a 45 ton a day plant to start out with we can actually scale that to be as much as 75 tons a day. So the short answer to the question, Frank, is we can really think about this hydrogen hub and the funding that's available, this $8 billion of capital. The best thing we can do, if I were to talk to the policymaker right now, let's start identifying projects right away. Let's go spend this capital and let's really, really get this program accelerated so that we can then start to think about speed and scale that Chris has referred to, which is going to be so critical for us to get to where we need to get to. I mean, Chris, please add if you agree or disagree with that comment. You're on mute, Frank. You're on slightly Frank. different the take on this. The um, uh, the uh, NZA report uh, looked at a, a variety of fuel uses for hydrogen in case studies across your five pillars and five cases. Um, does the the model of a hydrogen hub give you comfort that the range of hydrogen uses that need to be uh, scaled will be, will be covered um, by, by development of hydrogen hubs or will they wind up with limited uh, uh, applications? 
Look, I think I think the hub concept that at least initially is probably going to focus on the supply side. Um, and so you're going to need incentives to try and really drive the uptake on the demand side. I mean, obviously, it's dominated by Petrochem today, um, but we really need it to participate in, in that host of different end uses that I talked about. And so, you know, in the design, the key will be in the design of these programs and making sure that you are trying to stimulate demand in different applications. Uh, so that has to be a condition. Um, the, the other thing I would have just said about, you know, I think, I think as the audience answered, I think a diverse, a, a large number of hubs in a diverse range of geographies is a good idea. I would just go and add one little thing, fund the hubs in a diverse range, but permit them at scale. So pre-permit very large hubs, and fund seed programs within those. Um, we've really got to kickstart the scale and the speed now. That's an interesting uh, segue over to another point. Um, in the NZA study, you describe a successful transition to net zero as having to overcome several risks. And the report indicates four key risks that must be mitigated through widespread and coordinated actions. You touched on the first two failure to, to deploy physical assets and infrastructure at unprecedented rates and failure to mobilize capital investment at unprecedented rates. There were two more uh, uh, items in that risk to success. Uh, failure to gain and sustain social license, which goes to permitting and acceptability of new technology. And then- uh, You went back on the mute again, right? Failure, the other was failure to mitigate disruptions to the uh, existing workforce and fossil. How um, important is it that we get the um, acceptance of social license for this large endeavor of hydrogen right um, to avoid roadblocks in the development as, as these technologies scale? Yeah, critical. I mean, you know, th those, we called them actually, uh, and I, I, we're reluctant to use this term, but we called them four critical failure modes. You don't get every one of them right. You will fail in your efforts to get to net zero. And so... You know, we think about community support and some people will say, well, look, the community's coming along here. The community hasn't begun to see what net zero looks like. Mm -hmm. You know, we've, we've, we're, we're just at the beginning. The cumulative impacts as we really expand renewable energy, but also as we expand bioenergy and as we expand nuclear and CCS, depending on the pathway, this is going to require communities to really be um, more than just a, a acceptance, right? They, it, it's a social contract in which they are supporting the transition as opposed to just passively accepting. That, that's going to require new models of the way we engage communities in development. I think it is, it's all going to have to be much more sensitive and much more inclusive. I would argue that it's probably going to require us in these hubs and in these new developments to consider the the ownership role, you know, and, and the, the sharing of value with communities and different stakeholders. Mm -hmm. That hasn't been the way we've gone about this in the past. Um, but I think as we move through this transition, we're going to we're going to need to see more of that. Um, I'm going to segue a bit over to capital markets because Chris's point about new models and new structures was um, uh, important in the development. Anybody who's been involved in project development knows that you have to make sure that the, uh, the communities and the uh, 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 stakeholders in an area where, where a project's being built will, um, will not uh, be negative. But when it comes to capital markets, uh, the amount of money that you describe, uh, Chris, uh, $2.7 trillion uh, in the short term uh, for uh, scale up, uh, while that isn't all going to hydrogen, uh, it sits broadly across all kinds of, uh, of uh, fuel conversions and transition. The, um, you know, and this is a bit of a question for Sanjay, uh, two part. Are the capital markets poised to deliver the level of uh, investment needed to hit that scale? And the second part is, um, you know, will the, will the capital flow in a manner similar to renewables uh, or are there unique structures that are required for hydrogen projects and, and uh, is the financial community ready to adopt uh, new structures? Well, great, great question again, Frank, right? So uh, 
by the way, also on one of these uh, points on the workforce from fossil industry to the new industry, if I may just make one quick point on that as well. Sure. Right? Just so that everybody's aware of, right? The team that we have built at Plug, right? In terms of building some of this green hydrogen plant. So they either come from solar and wind industry with that know-how, and they're complemented with folks that are coming from either LNG or the refining industry or the traditional power industry. Because the skill set is so transferable, right? So I think when we think about this workforce transition, is a perfect complement to this energy transition that we're talking about because they find a perfect platform to go to doing very similar work that they are doing, but that is going to be better for the world and the society as a whole, right? I think this is something which is just really highlight because new energy industry is going to be able to really use the talent and the skill set that folks have learned in the fossil fuel industry. I come back to the capital question, Frank, right? So uh, look, I mean, I think, let's think about the evolution in the solar and the wind industry for a second, right? What has happened there? So when the first large solar scale project were trying to be financed, obviously DOE loan guarantee program played a pretty significant role in that to really make it a lot more bankable, attract a lot of back leverage and the project finance capital. Right? When folks were looking at that initial investment, the cost of financing the solar assets were like 14, 15% kind of an you know, project level return, right? You fast forward that 10 years, levelized cost of solar is now competitive against single cycle and even combined cycle gas fired power plant. And folks are now comfortable with 6% equity return, not project return, 6% equity return, tremendous benefit in the reduction in the cost of that. Now, second is the production tax credit for wind industry and what the levelized cost of wind energy has done, you know, compete against the price of coal in some location if you get the right capacity factor, right? And there are other detail and the nuances here, which I mean, most of you understand in terms of base load versus the intermittency aspect of it. But when you look at the benefit of that production tax credit for the wind industry, what it has been able to do from a back leverage tax equity to drive the cost of that renewable electricity down and really draw a lot of capital, right? You no longer are just attracting capital from equity investor. You're now able to attract capital from standard private equity folks. You're able to attract capital from infrastructure fund. You're able to attract capital from pension funds, right? So the pool and availability of the capital went up a lot, resulting in reduction in the cost of that capital and the liquidity in the market. Is the hydrogen industry and the green hydrogen industry there today? Not there today. No, it's not, right? Look, we've been fortunate that we've had access to capital markets, but that's largely been equity capital, right? So if there is, and that's why we're a big supporter of the production tax credit that is being talked about, we hope that this actually hurdles the roadblock that we're maybe seeing here and moves forward pretty rapidly because there is a parallel to be drawn here in terms of reduction in the levelized cost of green hydrogen, similar to what we've seen with the renewable industry. And that will have the same benefit of attracting a lot of capital, right? Today, you might have to build like what Plug is prepared to do today. That's what we're looking to do. That, you know, we will probably put our own equity capital to build these plants, but that's not an optimal model, right? You need to be able to go to the bank, put back leverage. You need to attract low cost infrastructure fund, the scale and the speed of how this capital has to come in. I think, frankly, will be tremendously benefited by things like, you know, hey, hub, the grant that the hub can get, right? Things like production tax credit, almost like some sort of a long-term offtake, if you would, right? So now you have a minimum threshold of what is my debt service coverage ratio and how much leverage I can put in this project just backed by the production tax credit. That's what we need to see happen. Will the capital flow? I mean, look, I think uh, energy has always been an industry that's seen a lot of capital in it. There's a potential to do a lot of green bonds issuance, right? We actually at Plug did the first ever convertible green bond out in the market as well. So Frank, I think uh, it's hard to say, absolutely yes, the capital will be there, but I think the pieces and the ingredients of what we're trying to do from a policy industry, I think should allow us to really have access to that capital. You know, look, and again, we gotta get this right, right? And I think the investment banks, large banks have to also have a right view hey, this is a sector that I'm going to actually allocate capital, even if it doesn't check all the box, right? So that's, I think, is the kind of the effort and the work that has to go on for us to be able to accomplish this. 
Chris, any complimentary thoughts based upon your development of those large sums of money? Any, any sense of the ability or inability to, to gather that capital? Yeah, look, I, th I think I'd re reinforce uh, some of the things that Sanjay said. I think for me, there is, enough, there is an, an abundance of low cost capital waiting to invest in the clean economy after it's built. The, the critical issue is developing the pipeline of projects, which is really the balance sheet equity question. And, you know, one of the things we've got to remember is the net zero transitions are more capital intensive. So yes, a lot of money's always flowed into the energy sector, but what we're talking about is a much more capital intensive energy system, which, may, which is like anything from three to four at least times more capital intensive than the traditional energy system. So, so basically we've got to ramp that up. And, you know, whilst we think there's a lot of capital flowing into solar and wind today, we're going at about half the pace we need to average this decade, right? And so the whole process of how we invest equity to, to develop the pipeline of projects is the issue. In the US today, it takes something like four to eight years, depending on location and depending on the specific projects, to take a solar project or a wind project from uh, concept to commercial operations. That's too long, right? So, so you know, the way to, the way to really accelerate this capital is to really streamline permitting processes, uh, I agree, de-risk some of the uh, some of the offtake and so forth, and this is where your, your tax credits and and uh, and your renewable fuel standards and so forth can participate. But you know we've really got to make sure that we do focus on the end game. And right now, even in wind and solar, we are not going anywhere near fast enough. Well, I um, you know we are we are really grateful today to have two thought leaders uh, with two sides of the spectrum, both the the, the deep ground zero knowledge of, of the data, the information and the, and the decision factors and ground zero knowledge of how to develop hydrogen businesses. One of the goals of this, this uh, workshop is to surface the ideas that policymakers might find uh, useful. Uh, and you know, when policymakers look at developing uh, projects or, or, or funding, funding projects, putting money out or, or US Congress looks at to the merits of the point, there's, there's the there's the primary benefit of getting money at work to build a market, but then there's always an expectation of a secondary benefit. So I wanna to touch on a couple of items here. One with respect to um, uh, you know, US technology growing worldwide. And, and maybe this is somewhat for Sanjay because Plug is, a, is a, certainly a leading company based in the US with expanding uh, interest and, and partnerships around the world. And a key element of the U.S. hydrogen development in the states is to is to expand the opportunities for U.S. companies. Um, how do you comment? Can you comment on how you see the, the insertion of uh, investment and the uh, growth of hydrogen in the U.S. benefiting U.S. companies who are also seeking to develop uh, projects, partnerships abroad? I mean, Frank, I think um, let me let me maybe touch on some live examples for us, right? So we are um, obviously we're a New York State based company. That's where we we've grown up and we have a big presence in New York. And uh, look, it's a global business right now um, in terms of um, so talking about the global expansion. I mean, you know, Renault, French company, we are a US based company that is providing fuel cell technology into fuel cell electric vehicle for the light commercial market. Right. It's I think the level of work we've done quality of our product cost reduction roadmap and the execution capabilities has played a very big role in that partnership to materialize. Now think about the work we're doing with the group at SK Group, right? There is other players in that market as well in South Korea that have got fuel cell technology, right? We're working with them on some very large stationary power related opportunity, working with them on hydrogen refueling opportunity. And we just supplied our fuel cell technology to Edison Motor, which is the best company in South Korea, right? Now let's take it into Australia. So we're actually talking to Fortescue about, is there a gigafactory there, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, But look, having said all that, but we're very focused on making sure that we're protecting our IP. All the hard work that has gone here, we wanna make sure the IP is protected, right? But having said that, energy is a global business, fuel cell application is a global business. And I think what we've been able to do 
work on the hydrogen side, work on the fuel cell application side, I think has been one of the big differentiating factor that has actually had a lot of inbound for us, frankly, Frank, from a lot of big players on a global basis. And that's why you've seen all this partnership that have materialized. And finally, look, we just announced this 100 megawatt electrolyzer deal where we wanna build this 100 megawatt electrolyzer facility to support an ammonia plant before COP27, right? And it's a consortium out of Egypt as well. So I think, uh, why did, why did we win that, win that deal? And uh, in the speed that we did, because they felt comfortable about the fact that we can execute on the timeline. We actually already have a gigafactory. We have the balance sheet, we have the track record. And more importantly, we're also using some of this technology for our own green hydrogen plant as well, right? So there's a lot of knowledge sharing that can happen. But having said all that, as we go global, we wanna make sure that we're keeping our technology and IP protected as well. Well, it, it, it seems that that was a resounding positive note that if, if members of Congress and the U.S. Department of Energy move quickly to develop at scale and with speed in the U.S., U.S. companies who will partner, who will invest in the technology here are going to be able to leverage that around the world. And uh, it should be something that, that we all give confidence to the DOE as they look at their roadmap. Um, something, uh, you know, I'm going to bring back a point. It's not, not really a, a question, but I want to make sure we don't lose this. So whoever's taking notes, Peter, Alex, uh, or Connor Dolan from FCHEA, you both touched on an important point that I think we should, we should uh, not overlook. And that is that as, as the U.S. develops its roadmap, it really needs to look at convincing or messaging to industries that they should be adopting and embracing this change. And that that, that extra, um, I'll call it marketing, messaging, and value um, that this is in everybody's best interest sometimes gets overlooked in a, in a technical or economic sort of roadmap, but the, the, the softer and maybe even more potent um, messaging that comes out is if, if the country accepts this change and embraces it, all the acceleration and scale will happen at a faster pace. And that's a note we'll have to take when we, when we summarize some of these points of this, this webinar. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on a, a question about innovation. Um, much of the technology that is um, that'll be immediately deployed is is known. It's been proven. It is um, uh, going to be applied in different different forms and, and variations. But with the launch of a new industry, there is there is always room for broad innovation and the technologies that are yet to be developed. So what I want to do is put the two of you in the mindset of two guys in a garage in Los Altos, California, in 1976 envisioning computer applications yet to be commercial. Are there technologies and applications and uses of hydrogen that'll emerge once the momentum and social adoption has started? Put your visionary hats on, tell me what the future might bring. Would you like to go first, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the reason, the reason I mix business, social sciences and engineering is I wasn't a particularly good engineer, so. <laughs> Um, uh, look, I've got no doubt, right? Um, and, uh, you know, that's why we have five pathways. We, you know, we we're very quick to say we have no idea what the future looks like. So, uh, yeah, yeah, look, I'm, I'm, I'm the worst person to ask what is a future uh, undiscovered use of hydrogen. <laughs> but, but the one thing I'm sure of is that there will be something now. Um, to be frank, as someone who, who focuses on the net zero delivery challenge, I tend to say that's the last thing I want to work on. I actually want to work on deploying what we know. Uh, we know everything we need to get to net zero, right? Some of it is technology ready, but not commercial ready. And so we need governments and industry to work together to, to break any barriers to make it truly commercial. Um, and to really accelerate that process. Um, those things that seem a little technologically immature, we need to put some R&D money in to just drive them forward. Um, but, but of course, we need to invest in discovery and, and we should invest in new discoveries and we should be alert to them. And we, as they emerge, we should want to accelerate those too. I mean, when we get to 2050, this job's not done, right? We may be at net zero, but we're going to be replacing assets. We want to bring costs further down. Uh, and so we need to think about the technologies that replace what we call today innovative. 
Um, but as for what is this future, oh, man, <laughs> I, I really don't know. Fair enough. Sanjay, and Crystal these are always It's always hard to sort of get into exactly what that could be, right? But, uh, but let me, again, I think as I, so let's think about um, if we were to envision a new type of energy infrastructure in the new energy world, right? So um, I'm gonna dream a little bit here, if I may, Frank, right? Since that's the question, right? So let, let's go ahead and dream a bit where uh, we don't have any fossil fuel generation. We're no longer using diesel, right? We're no longer, we're actually, we've displaced uh, gasoline with battery electric vehicle and diesel with fuel cell electric vehicle. You now have a new world where obviously there's a lot of autonomous driving, right? Even now fuel cell application and electrification has taken hold even in the aerospace industry, right? So this is, let's say 2050, where now you need, as I think Chris rightfully pointed out, tremendous amount of renewable power and power in general, but it has to be renewable. Right? And then I think then you need to think about, okay, so that's on the generation side. What are the technological breakthrough that maybe is needed on the electrolyzer side? Do we need to be thinking about a hundred megawatt stack maybe instead of one, right? Is that what we should be thinking about, right? And what are the innovation that has to happen for us to scale that up? Going from one, five, 10, 25, maybe within the roadmap, but how do I really think about a electrolyzer that is going to support generation of thousand tons per day green hydrogen plant? Not 10, not 15, but thousand plus tons per day. Then you're starting to think about 10,000 tons per day of green hydrogen plant. What are the innovation needed from power electronics? Right? What are the innovation needed from electrolyzer side? And then the next piece is, how am I going to transport this hydrogen? It's probably a 36 inch pipeline. What are the innovation that is needed for us to displace natural gas pipeline with hydrogen pipeline? What are the things I need to do from a long duration storage perspective? Is salt cavern enough? Are there other ways to think about long duration storage for this hydrogen, right? And then finally, the end user application, I think that's a continued innovation, right? That probably is going to follow. We, we sort of talk about this as a learning curve that the plug had. Every time we double the number of system in the field, we take our cost by 25%. And that is gonna allow us to continue to drive the cost down and create a little bit of this as a part of the whole green hydrogen ecosystem, right? Creates a bit of that flywheel effect where you're producing this massive amount of green hydrogen. Hydrogen is ubiquitous, economical, many more applications becomes uh, available. More people are working on more apps. We have a true network effect where cost of green hydrogen is going down, demand for green hydrogen is going up, and many more applications are you know, becoming more and more real. And a new world where majority of our power is really coming from renewable sources. We have built a lot of this in the solar and wind belt in the US, and we have become truly, truly energy sufficient. I always used to hate to use the word independent. Sometimes I don't know what that means, right? energy is sufficient where we are probably talking about an economy where we might even be able to think about export of even this green renewable energy rather than the other way around, right? So when I think about it from that perspective, these are the areas where I'll probably be spending a lot of time with a beer in my hand thinking through what else should I be working on so that that vision is accomplished. We were asked to um, provide some takeaways, and uh, I'm going to ask you both a question as we get down to the end of our uh, time frame. But I want to point out something uh, that I've taken away in just listening to the two of you, that uh, the challenges of decarbonization are clearly daunting. But both by your, your enthusiasm, Sanjay, and uh, Chris, your command of, of the information that we need and the, and the perspective, I, I am just more enthusiastic than ever that there's a pathway for hydrogen as a key component of decarbonization. And I am really pleased to be part of this panel and part of the industry helping to make that move. The takeaway question, if you had one item to convey to US policymakers as they contemplate the US roadmap, what would it be? One item, Sanjay. Ask $3 PTC as soon as possible and work with the industry. For green hydrogen, obviously. I'm sticking with hydrogen, so. Fair enough. Chris. Leaning, hands on the steering wheel and drive this ship. Don't leave it to markets. Take control of it. Take control. Interesting. 
Well, I want to thank both of you because we're down at the end of our uh, segment here. I've got a few more questions. I could go for two more hours, but uh, we've heard so many things, speed, scale, innovation, readiness of capital markets. Um, I'm excited. I'm going to turn this back over to Peter. Thank you both for this, uh, this panel. Peter, take it to the next level with our right. electrolysis folks. Right. And, and of course, messaging is another key takeaway, right? Messaging. Uh, yeah, very important. Uh, you hardly ever hear about hydrogen when they talk about the electric vehicles, right? You know, but the fuel cells are clearly a part of that. So why don't we take um, a, a two minute uh, stretch break, come back at, you know, 315, 316, and we'll then move on to the electrolysis panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. I really Great appreciate panel, it. Guys. Thanks yeah. a lot. Yeah. Thank, Bye. thank you. Bye -bye. Yeah. Okay, so why don't we, uh, oh, Mark's on great. And, uh, I guess people can turn on their videos, right? Great. Yes, as, as my fellow panelists start arriving, they can turn on their videos. And then Peter, I'll let you kick us off as soon as you think that folks are done stretching or stretched out <laughs> or uh, are sufficiently flexible for a panel on electrolysis. Oh God. Uh, make sure you have your Gatorade, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Get those electrolytes going in there. Um, so why don't we, we just begin here. Um, so our second panel is on electrolysis. And why do we pick electrolysis? Uh, we pick it because the bill, uh, bipartisan, bipartisan infrastructure law, has a billion dollars of grant money allocated to electrolysis. That's a lot of money. And that clearly shows that Congress thinks that electrolysis is the key to the future. The key to the, this, or an important part of this, this uh, transition to net zero. And we have today a really uh, excellent panel. Um, the panel is going to be moderated by Mark Roth from NREL. And uh, let me just say a couple of words about Mark. Mark was on the panel that we had in May. And he is the uh, one of the key authors of the uh, H2O scale report. Is that, is that the way to describe the report? Um, he, you know, he's a manager of the Industrial Systems and Fuels Group in the Strategic Energy Analysis Center at NREL in, in Go, uh, Golden, Colorado. And in that role, Mark leads the group of analysis investigating opportunities to improve energy use in the industrial and transportation sectors. Um, and um, I think this is really the key. Uh, Mark is also leading the multi-laboratory 
uh, effort. And Mark, you can tell us about what those labs are. We know Enrol is obviously one, but I think Scandia and others are in there. Uh, the effort to analyze the technical and economic potential of the H2 scale project as concept in, uh, and uh, to convert existing nuclear power plants to flex between electricity and hydrogen production. Um, Mark, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Uh, thanks, Peter. Yeah, uh, so as Peter mentioned, I'm at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and I've been leading a lot of the DOE analysis effort around H2 at scale. And I appreciate the, the uh, invitation and the opportunity to be able to moderate this panel today. The way we've got the panel set up and the, the focus of the panel is, as Peter mentioned, the role of electrolysis in developing low carbon hydrogen. And the way we've got, we've got this panel set up is I'm going to use that H2 at scale analysis work that we have done to kind of lay the groundwork, why we're focusing on electrolysis, kind of where we're headed, what we think some of the potential is. And then that will be followed by Kathy Ayers at uh, Nell, uh, Nell Hydrogen USA, uh, who will talk a little bit about electrolysis technologies and then Nell's strategy. She will be followed by Rafi Garabedian at Electric Hydrogen, who is, and I'll introduce Kathy and Rafi and Dave all formally later, but just to let you know how we're gonna do this. She'll be followed by Rafi, who's gonna talk about the, uh, the strategy at Electric Hydrogen Company. And then Dave Edwards from Air Liquide will come on and speak a little bit about uh, some of the work at Air Liquide and how they see as a major hydrogen producer today, how they see their role moving forward. So that's kind of the structure of the panel as a whole and, and what we'll be doing. We're hoping to save about 20 minutes to the end for a moderated Q&A, and I am very open to taking questions uh, via chat that I can moderate for that Q&A. So feel free to uh, share questions via the chat for that. Um, and as I mentioned, I will... I will introduce each panelist formally uh, right before their uh, few minutes to be able to talk and to be able to uh, give you a little bit of background on themselves and on their areas. But before we get started, uh, we've got a survey question for you. We just heard a lot about uh, a lot about some of the challenges and some of the needs in terms of moving fast and large scale growth. Uh, but there's other concerns that may limit that growth and may limit that beyond some of the things that we were talking about before. And so we would love to see uh, responses from you in terms of whether you think that some of those limiting factors might be just the capital cost and the cost of producing hydrogen, the efficiency, safety, social acceptance, or if there are other issues that, that you see as being a bigger issue that we should be focusing on today. And we'll give you a moment before Alex will, will show us the results, which will give us an idea of where we are, and then we'll jump into the presentations. So please answer. And Alex, are you gonna show us? Thank you. So it looks like there's a lot of discussion around capital costs, especially around electrolysis, which is great. We'll talk quite a bit about that uh, as, as we move through the presentation. And I think that'll be really valuable to help us kind of focus where we're going. So with that, I'm going to share mine, um, uh, share my presentation and we can go ahead and get started. Um, Alex or Peter, let me know if you are not seeing my presentation in the full screen. Otherwise, I'm going to assume that we are. As I mentioned, my role in this panel is to give you a little bit of background on uh, where we see electrolysis fitting into the, uh, the future energy system and why electrolysis and hydrogen are really interesting opportunities from an analytical viewpoint. Uh, that Chris uh, mentioned a lot of that in terms of some of the work that they had done out of the Princeton Net Zero Energy uh, study that was released about a year ago. This was released a little bit before that and was really based on what we see as the H2 at scale concept. The H2 at scale is, is a DOE initiative that's really focusing on hydrogen as an energy intermediate. Those of us that have been around hydrogen since the Bush era and the early aughts, uh, remember that in many ways, hydrogen was then focused on taking hydrogen from many different sources and focusing it on how to support the tra support transportation, especially fuel cell light duty vehicles, because our biggest concern then was importing, uh, importing oil. 
And this concept kind of flips it on its head. It's looking at lots and lots of different applications for hydrogen produced in ways that really support the overall energy system, which is in many ways, for, uh, many ways, primarily the electric grid, but also other opportunities, including gas, to be able to produce that hydrogen and how it fits into the hydrogen system as a whole. So with this concept that we really developed about five years ago, what we did is we tried to estimate what we call the serviceable consumption potential, which is in many ways, a, not necessarily an economic potential, but kind of the total potential that we saw for hydrogen. To put that into context, today's markets for hydrogen, it's around 10 million metric tons per year. And that 10 million metric tons per year is used primarily for the refining, for ammonia production, refining where it's hydrocracking and hydrodesulfurization of, of crude oil, ammonia production, so mixing with uh, mixing with nitrogen to be able to produce uh, ammonia for fertilizer and synthetic hydrocarbons. What we did was we sat down and said, well, how big might these markets get by 2050 if there's ways to get there? And not necessarily thinking about economics, but thinking about kind of considerations and some competition. For example, our light duty vehicles, we use 40% of the fleet, thinking there's no way that all of it will be hydrogen, but a 40% share might be enough. That adds up to 10 times or over 10 times the total size of the hydrogen market. So a very, very large market at over 100 million metric tons per year. We also sat down then, and we as a team, meaning multi, multiple laboratories, including not just NREL, but also Argonne National Laboratory, Pacific Northwest, Lawrence Livermore and Sandia National Laboratory, sat down and said, well, if there, what's the economic potential? Thinking about supply and demand and what are the opportunities there? This figure on the right breaks down that supply and demand into our five different scenarios. Like Chris mentioned, we couldn't predict the future, so we came up with multiple scenarios to try to understand what the implications and challenges are between them. As you can see on the left, they're broken down into refining, metals production in silver, ammonia production in orange, biofuel production to be able to convert biofuels or biomass to sustainable aviation fuels in the dark blue, methanol production in and kind of the mustard yellow, light duty vehicles, fuel cell vehicles in the light blue, and then heavy duty vehicles in the purple. That's the demand side. I think for this talk, the supply side is a more interesting one. The, the steam methane reforming of natural gas is kind of the reference scenario based on it being the most economically competitive in reference futures, uh, followed by some hydrogen production from uh, economically challenged nuclear power plants with high temperature electrolysis in this yellow color. And then green is low temperature electrolysis from uh, what we call low cast dispatch constrained electricity, which is part of the electricity coming from potentially renewables like wind or solar. What's really happening down here is we're really seeing a lot of electrolysis growth to be able to serve 36 million metric tons per year of hydrogen market type size with some additional electrolysis from high temperature or some additional high temperature electrolysis to be able to serve the remainder of the market. So what does that mean? That leads into not just a lot of energy for electrolysis, but also energy that supports the grid as a whole. Looking at wind, which are these five points on the right, we're looking at the same five scenarios. This low natural gas resource, high natural gas price scenario doesn't have a lot of hydrogen in it, but you can see that we have about 2,000 terawatt hours of wind generation per year. To put that into context, uh, last year, I believe we were at less than 400 terawatt hours of wind generation. So it's a quite a bit of growth there. What happens over here, we've got a lot of this lowest cost electrolysis, and we bring down the capital cost of electrolyzers enough that we're producing a significant amount of, of hydrogen via low cost, via low temperature electrolysis. We end up with not just this green part of the bar, which is electricity to produce hydrogen, but also an increase in the blue part of the bar, which means that part of the time, uh, new wind generation would, is being built that wouldn't be built otherwise to be able to produce some electricity for the grid and some electricity to produce hydrogen. If it were to be built only for electricity for the grid, then it would probably wouldn't be built because if, during the hours when it would be generating electricity, there would be not enough available left, or there would be at the there would be not enough load on the grid to be able to utilize that electricity. So major learning is how might we do that. And in that right-hand scenario, we end up with eight quads of energy coming from hydrogen, which is about 16% of the total energy that's used in the US. And that would be just to make hydrogen. For comparison today, we're at about 2%. So hydrogen moves from a significant portion of the energy sector to a huge portion of the energy sector. 
So what's necessary to get there? Um, as you probably already know, the hydrogen shot initiative is to achieve $1 hydrogen, $1 per kilogram hydrogen in one decade or by 2032. Right now for clean hydrogen, we're at about $5 per kilogram. So it's going to $2 per kilogram and then $1 per kilogram by 2030, which involves reducing electricity costs. You're getting access to lower cost electricity, reducing the capital cost and reducing the operating and maintenance cost. We're doing a lot of work in terms of reducing the overall the capital cost, which you'll hear a lot more from this panel as well as some of the DOE work. And that involves both R&D to improve the technologies and manufacturing scale, which is shown in the figure on the right, to be able to achieve supply chains and manufacturing scales and the efficiencies that come with them to be able to bring down the cost. And then another way to be able to, to reduce the cost is reducing electricity price. I think one of the challenges is that you have to get to about uh, a 1.5 cent per kilowatt hour electricity to achieve that dollar per kilogram. Now, can you do that all the hours of the year? Probably not because there's capacity payments and there's other needs. However, this piece of work, which you can see the reference to down here below, shows that if you use electricity when its price is low, in other words, when generation is high and load is low or one or the other or both, then you might be able to optimize in such a way, especially with low cost electrolysis, to be able to achieve numbers like the $1.60 we have here with $100 per kilowatt, or sorry, $100 per kilowatt electrolyzer and this historic electricity price from Palo Verde. So that's an existing price on the market today. With lower prices as more renewables go in, there's opportunities to get even better than that. So that lays out an overview of what we're doing and what we're trying to do as a whole within DOE and within, uh, within the hydrogen community to be able to bring down the cost and why we see that as a real opportunity. That completes my presentation and opens us up for our second survey question of the day, which is what applications should green hydrogen focus on, should we focus on with green hydrogen first, whether that's backup power or energy storage, the chemical industry, the manufacturing processes like steel refining where hydrogen is valuable, off-road transportation, especially maritime and aviation, which are significant, but require liquid fuels in many cases, or on-road transportation like fuel cell vehicles using hydrogen gas. And Alex, when you feel like we've gotten enough responses, go ahead and flip over. Wow, it's split pretty evenly amongst uh, most of the applications with the exception of off-road transportation, which to be honest is, is one that I don't see many, other, many alternatives to. So it's an interesting one, although uh, maybe not the first one we need to address. So thank you. These are, this is an interesting set of responses here. With that, I'll turn it over to our, our first speaker within the panel, uh, Kathy Ayers. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing Kathy for, I don't know, Kathy, maybe 15 <laughs> years now. Um, Kathy is the, the Vice President of R&D for Dell and definitely a leader within the hydrogen industry. And in that role, she's responsible for developing and executing Dell's strategy in uh, proton exchange membrane or PEM electrolysis, as we call it. Um, she, in doing so, she's got a huge number of projects across a range of collaborators, including many of my colleagues at NREL, others in academia and in industry, and, and many other places, and is leading a lot of their efforts. Kathy not only does all of that, but I, I see her, or I used to see her regularly at hydrogen and fuel cell technical advisory committee meetings, uh, informing the Secretary of Energy about, about uh, hydrogen technologies. And I know she was also part of the Basic Energy Sciences Advisory Committee for the Secretary of Energy. She's received a number of awards and is a person that you see quite regularly in this area. So with that, Kathy, I'll turn it over to you and uh, let you walk us through some of the electrolysis technologies and then Nell's strategy. So thank you, Mark, for the, the very flattering um, introduction. Yes, I do think it's been about 15 years. Um, so the, the first part of my talk is is really for the panel in general. Um, this is not specific to Nell, but just to give people a sense of the different electrolyzer technologies and where we see them fitting. And then I'll transition into some more Nell specifics. So I think um, Mark 
gave some good segues into some of my slides. Um, you, you saw some of the decreases in cost um, for electrolysis with time and scale. Um, and so that's what one of the things that really makes electrolysis become interesting uh, for this green hydrogen question. Um, there was a question in the chat about where is uh, hydrogen from natural gas or, or blue hydrogen. Um, the hydrogen itself from SMR is typically in the range of one and a half to two dollars a kilogram. Um, Dave might be able to talk about what the, the blue piece of that with the CCS adds. Um, but generally, that's kind of the number we're competing against in terms of trying to get low cost um, green hydrogen to the same point. Um, if you're trying to do that, if your electricity cost is up in that five cents a kilowatt hour, um, then your electricity cost alone is going to be over three dollars a kilogram of hydrogen. And so that's why that's one of the reasons why um, it wasn't so much considered. The other was that electrolysis was at smaller scales and at these small scales, the cost of hydrogen is is quite high from electrolysis. When you start talking about the electricity costs that Mark was mentioning now in the $2 kilowatt range, you can shift this whole curve down. And as we're making electrolyzers larger and larger, um, the cost is coming down. This purple line represents the capital cost um, with the, the higher electricity cost. And so if this whole purple curve shifts down due to the change in electricity cost, now you're getting more competitive with natural gas. So the product scale is continuing to increase. It's starting to become relevant for some of these applications. Um, and also, I think there's more of a sense of urgency on decarbonization. So if we're going to decarbonize, we have to have renewable hydrogen for things like um, chemical production. And also, if you're going to convert captured CO2 into anything useful, um, you need protons to do that as well. Um, so now to talk a little bit about where the technologies are today, there's really two um, technologies that are totally commercial and then a couple that are more emerging. So if we start with the commercial technologies, they're both low temperature technologies um, below the boiling point of water. Um, the first is the liquid alkaline systems. Um, these have been around for 100 years, um, and I'll talk about a little bit more about those in a couple of slides. But basically, they use catalysts, which are common metals like nickel um, and other transition metals. Um, they split water by feeding concentrated alkaline electrolyte into the cell, which makes the electrolyte conductive. You create hydrogen on one side and oxygen on the other with a porous separator separating the two gas streams. Um, because this is somewhat porous, the two sides of this have to be balanced in pressure. Um, they're pretty high efficiency, but relatively low current density. Um, the next commercial technology, which I think most of us on this panel um, have more experience in, is the proton exchange membrane systems that Mark mentioned. The catalysts are much more expensive, um, but we can run these at much higher current density, and so we get better utilization out of each cell. Um, the circulating fluid in this case is water. So most typically you're feeding water on the oxygen side of the cell. You create oxygen at that electrode and protons and this membrane, um, which is in the, what, what these are named after, conducts the protons to the other side where they form hydrogen. So the membrane is what is separating your two gas streams as opposed to this porous separator. And that allows things like um, a differential in pressure between the two sides um, without having gas crossover. These cells are also much thinner. So these alkaline cells are typically measured in, in inches per cell, uh, where these are measured in cells per inch. Um, and so you can see the relative scale of a relatively similar capacity stacks um, on the two sides. The two technologies that are uh, somewhat less mature, um, I would say I'm going to start with anion exchange membrane systems, even though I think they're the least commercially mature because they follow well from the other two I've already talked about. They're really kind of a hybrid between the liquid alkaline systems and the PEM. So instead of having a membrane that conducts protons, you have a membrane that conducts hydroxide. Um, and so you can use the same materials as the liquid alkaline, but you have the advantages of the membrane. Uh, the problem is those membranes for this type of system are not yet stable enough um, and only very small systems have been demonstrated. But in theory, if you can get um, reliable membranes, then you could make them look very similar to a PEM stack. 
And then finally, I, I think uh, I would call a near commercial technology is high temperature electrolysis using um, oxide conductors. These are very high temperature, typically over 600 degrees C, and so they're using steam as opposed to liquid electrolyte. Um, that enables much higher efficiency, um, but they tend to not be as good with on and off cycling um, because of the thermal um, stresses on the stack at these high temperatures. Um, but they are increasing in maturity. Uh, and I think, as Mark said, they will likely play a role um, once they get there in certain applications. So each of these technologies has its strengths and challenges, and I'm not going to go into them in a lot of detail. Um, we can look at the slide, and I also know this is being recorded, so um, we can have, we'll have a record of it later. Um, but essentially, I would say, to summarize, typically the liquid alkaline and solid oxide technologies do better with uh, steady state types of power um, like hydropower, um, grid, nuclear, um, whereas the membrane based systems tend to do well with highly dynamic power like wind and solar. Um, they have their different issues in terms of where they're optimized um, in terms of things like footprint, uh, what the circulating fluid is, uh, the capital cost that's possible, but I think they will all play different roles um, because as Chris was saying earlier, this is a huge um, area that needs to be addressed, huge amounts of hydrogen that we would need to produce. And so depending on the application, um, a different one, different technology may be optimal. Uh, so to drill a little bit more down into the low temperature technologies or the commercial technologies, because I think that's what we'll focus on in the panel, just to give a little bit of a sense of the legacy of the, the PEM and KOH technologies. Um, the KOH technology, or the alkaline liquid technology, I would say is, is an example of everything old is new again. So um, back in the 50s, there were already plants being built at the 100 megawatt scale. Um, they were actually used for exactly some of the things that we're talking about. So you had hydropower um, feeding some of these plants and then using this hydrogen to make ammonia, um, which is one of the applications of interest today in terms of decarbonization. Um, they were really designed for efficiency um, and low operating cost, but that drove some of the cell uh, characteristics that make it better operational with uh, steady state power versus variable power. And there are ways to get around that, um, which are things that we're looking at, at now. Similarly, the PEM technologies uh, were developed for a specific application and not necessarily the renewable applications that we're talking about today. In this case, they were actually first generated for oxygen generation um, used for life support. And so that drove very different product requirements than when we're talking about using um, electrolysis to make hydrogen for industrial applications. Uh, these were for oxygen enclosed environments where you didn't have access to air. And so reliability trumped all other design features in terms of um, setting up these systems. They were also relatively low scale. So it wasn't until more recently that these products started to be optimized for the applications we're talking about today. And that's why there's still quite a bit of room um, in terms of uh, being able to reduce cost and improve efficiency. So to talk about PEM specifically, um, in the past, I would say the cost reduction has mainly been based on scaling existing technologies. And the cost reduction, it basically follows some um, engineering principles around um, power or uh, large scale process plants. So there's this rule of thumb of six tenths. Um, and you can see that if you plot the line that would follow this equation versus actual costs of some of the um, systems that we've built, it follows pretty well. So we think that just by increasing the scale of the plant, um, you can get quite a bit of cost reduction um, as Mark was showing. And then there's also quite a bit of room on the technology and manufacturing side, as has been mentioned a couple of times, we need to be able to make parts quicker with more automated processes um, and really optimize um, the components within the stack um, in order to drop the cost on that side as well. And I think you would see similar cost uh, reductions from most of the electrolyzer companies in the space. So with that, I'll transition over to Nell specifically. Um, we have over 90 years of experience in electrolyzer technology between the two electrolyzer sites. Um, so we uh, at Nell produce both the alkaline electrolyzers and the PEM electrolyzers. Our alkaline electrolysis division was established in 1927 in Norway, mainly making those very large scale electrolyzers. 
We now have two production sites in Norway, um, one in Notaden, which is our original site, and one in Haroya, which is currently producing at about 500 megawatts a year and is scalable to two gigawatts a year. Um, the PEM facility was established in 1996, so we've been around for 25 years. Um, we have over 2,700 systems in the field. And the current um, existing plant facility is capable of producing about uh, 150 megawatts per year in that footprint, but we do have capacity to build out um, behind this plant and we're learning a lot from the Haroya plant in terms of how we would scale to those kinds of capacities. Um, and then we do also have a fueling division, which I won't mention too much today, but that's located in uh, Herning, Denmark. So in terms of the, the alkaline side and the product scale that we're at, uh, our current stack that's mainly produced uh, is about a two megawatt stack. Um, you can gang those together within the balance of plant to make essentially any capacity um, plant that you want. Um, and this is an example of the Haroya facility. There's actually a video on our website of some of the automation, but you can see the scale of these relative to um, the workers in the factory. So these are um, process baths for some of the components. Um, they're very large uh, and these fit those round stacks that I was showing in, in one of the earlier slides in the first part. On the PEM side, we've also scaled to megawatt scale. Um, we have containerized systems that are in the one to two megawatt range. And then we're also now installing plants. Um, we have a current design that goes from five to 25 megawatts and we're concepting what we would do at some of these larger 100 megawatt plus installations. Um, and we currently have a facility going up in Spain at, at 20 megawatts where we've just uh, finished building and, and getting ready to ship all of the stacks for that facility. So in terms of where we see areas that we can still reduce cost, uh, I mentioned the system scale and how that just scales um, with capacity. There's room in the power electronics side um, because in the past, uh, electrolyzer stacks have, have mainly been low voltage and high current, which is less common for commercial supplies. And so we're working to better match up with the, um, the power supply manufacturers. Um, as mentioned, there's a lot we can do in automation, labor reduction, um, automating some of these processes like going to roll to roll types of processes can also improve our process capabilities so that we can make more precise parts, which means we can make them thinner reliably and make them higher performance. Um, material utilization, so things like lower amounts of the catalyst and thinner membranes. And then also going to higher current density, because if you're operating these at higher currents, that means you need less cells to get to the capacity that you have. Um, so that's the overview for us, and I will pass it back to you, Mark. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, I really appreciate both the Dell overview and your ability to simplify four very complex technologies <laughs> in such a way that we can then talk about them, them very clearly. Uh, thank you very much. We do have some questions we'll get into later on in the session around them. Uh, but the next person up on our panel is Rafi Garbedian, who is a co-founder and the CEO of the Electric Hydrogen Company. Uh, prior to joining Electric Hydrogen, Rafi had a really well-known and well-regarded career as the chief technology officer at First Solar, uh, which in which I didn't get to meet him, but it seems like everybody I know met Rafi during that during that time period. So Rafi is, is well known around the industry and has really done a lot in terms of the solar side and is hoping to take a lot of those lessons and be able to convert them over to uh, the, the electrolyzer side. Um, and I just learned that before First Solar, Rafi had another really impressive career doing microelectromechanical systems, which I won't go into, but I think there's, there's some lessons learned from that. So Rafi, I'll turn it over to you to give us some background on what electric hydrogen is doing and where you are focused. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Mark. It's great to be included today and actually an honor to be uh, able to speak in the same panel with Kathy and Dave. So uh, I appreciate the, uh, the chance to do this. Um, yeah, I've had a lot of interesting experiences and a lot of scar tissue developed along the way. Um, now applying some of that here in hydrogen production. Um, quick background on electric hydrogen. I don't have any slides to share, so um, I'm just going to speak to this. Uh, the company is a venture financed uh, deep tech uh, startup. We're building what we hope will be the next generation of green hydrogen production systems. 
Um, we're supported by investors, including Breakthrough Energy Ventures, Capricorn, Prelude, uh, Energy Impact Partners. Uh, these are some of the most experienced, serious, committed climate tech funds uh, in the business, at least at the um, early uh, venture phase. And we're, um, we're really proud that they've chosen to support us in our, our mission here. There isn't much about us um, out on the web in public, and uh, I can't give many details today about what we're doing, uh, but suffice to say, we're heads down quietly in the lab, building a product that we hope will, will be fairly revolutionary um, and help in the conversion of renewable energy to cheap, plentiful, renewable hydrogen. Our, our mantra is really simple at the company. Um, it's fossil parity cost at a scale that matters. And, uh, you know, fossil parity cost is, is uh, a topic we can talk at length about if, if people want to discuss it. Um, Kathy, I generally agree with your numbers. I think, you know, Henry Hub, kind of Louisiana, uh, gray hydrogen is about a buck 30 a kilo um, at the point of production. And, um, you know, with carbon capture and sequestration, if that comes to be a reality, which I think it will, maybe it floats up to north of a buck 50, almost $2 a kilo. So, so that's, that's the price point at which we cross over to parity and cost with the carbon intensive resource. And as we've experienced in both solar and wind, that cost parity stimulates adoption in a real and meaningful way, which is why it's our, our goal. Um, we've only been at it for a few years of electric hydrogen, it's early days. Um, we do not have 90 years of experience in hydrogen production but we're trying to move very, very quickly along a path to commercialization. Among the founding team at Electric, um, we have pretty much three decades, I think almost, of experience, executive experience from companies, including First Solar and Tesla, um, both iconic companies that have been involved in the revolution in renewable energy and the revolution in the automotive industry. Um, we're not electrochemists. Um, we're technologists. We have a lot of background, as you can imagine, in renewable energy, um, in device physics, in high volume, low cost manufacturing, and in systems engineering. And those are the experiences uh, that we're trying to bring to bear on the production of renewable hydrogen. Um, we're intentionally working to solve a particular problem. We, we believe that uh, only companies that can solve for very low cost at very large scale will be sustainably successful. And you know, I really appreciated the earlier comments um, from Chris in particular around the importance of, of scale. The um, economics of green hydrogen today, as uh, the survey pretty handily uh, highlighted, is dominated by CapEx. Um, with fully constructed and commissioned electrolyzer plants costing around $1,000 a kilowatt, around a dollar a watt. Um, some more, some a little less, but that's kind of the number, uh, at least in the Western world. As with any very expensive plant, the economics of operation motivate owners to run all the time at high capacity factor. And this remains true even as existing manufacturers learn, go down the learning curve and reduce plant costs to $600, $500 a kilowatt or so. Um, even at that state, it's still a high capacity factor plant. The problem is that at scale, high capacity factor energy is necessarily expensive and not discussed as much. It's necessarily dirty, unless you happen to have access to excess hydro of which there really isn't much. That's not a scalable resource. Um, the cleanest and cheapest power in the world, as Mark explained, is unfirmed solar and wind. And you know, really that's the resource that we think long and hard about at electric hydrogen, uh, coupling to electrolysis to produce fossil parity hydrogen. Um, our vision is just that, it's to produce large scale plants such that we can deploy profitably at radically lower capex. Very low capex facilitates the use of cheap green energy and should allow us to attain in many locations um, $1.50 a kilo and even to beat $1.50 a kilogram um, on the economics of it, which, uh, which again is our, 
our definition of fossil parity, we could debate. Um, as wind and solar get cheaper, we should be able to approach a dollar a kilogram, which frankly approaches thermal parity with natural gas if you include the uplifting costs from carbon capture. And you know that's a radical and revolutionary price point that um, will allow the displacement of fossil fuels um, across a really broad value chain in the energy industry. Um, I think that's, you know, if we're here talking about how to scale renewable hydrogen, that's how you do it. You get to fossil parity prices and that creates the market in the full. Um, there's no one component of an electrolysis system that obviously dominates the overall cost, which is why we take a systems engineering approach at electric. Um, we believe we've identified a pathway based on uh, the capabilities of a proprietary electrochemical cell technology we've developed that along with careful co-optimization at the system level, and Kathy mentioned some of the factors, but there are many, many opportunities to co-optimize and drive cost out of a constructed system. Uh, we believe with that kind of an approach, we can, we can get to the necessary fully installed capital costs that will facilitate uh, ultra low cost fossil parity hydrogen green hydrogen. So with that, I'll, um, I'll end my comments. Thank you for the, uh, the chance, Mark. Thank you, Rafi. Uh, I appreciate the, those, those comments and I uh, appreciate the challenge that you've taken on in terms of growing a, a brand new company in, in this industry. It's a, it's a big challenge and, and a very exciting one. Uh, we'll move from you to Dave Edwards, who is a director and he calls himself an advocate for hydrogen energy at, at Air Liquide. Um, Dave is, in many cases, the person I, I try to think about when I think about what does the current industry say, how are they thinking about things, and how do we really understand what it's going to take for future technologies to be competitive. So Dave provides that background and value because of his experience at Air Liquide for more than 25 years working in and around hydrogen in partnerships with industry, academia, and government entities, and really just trying to understand where hydrogen is. He's also one of the key players in the development of the, the, U, the McKinsey, well, the Fichia published work on, uh, on the potential for hydrogen within the US, uh, being the main leader from the Hydrogen Council on that. So he brings a lot of knowledge in terms of thinking about not just his company, but the industry as a whole. But here, I'll let Dave talk about where his company fits, where you're headed, and where you see hydrogen heading as a whole, Dave. Thanks, Mark, and uh, thanks to my fellow panelists. It's a, it's a great opportunity to talk about hydrogen in a time when, when things are really exciting and things are changing quickly. So um, I'm going to be the unruly panelist because as I went through my comments, I realized I'm going to generate more questions than I, than I generate answers. Um, and whether my panelists are able to answer these or whether these are time will tell uh, questions, we shall see. Um, I think Mark, you did a great job kicking us off. We all have a shared vision of what, of what the future looks like. Hydrogen at scale, ubiquitous amounts of low carbon hydrogen from electrolysis, uh, leading into the transportation sectors, the energy storage sectors, natural gas displacement, and all the places that we think hydrogen can make a difference. Um, this is gonna require many, many gigawatts of investment in electrolysis over the next 10 to 20 years. Um, we agree on the outcomes. We think we can get there with the targets. We think the scale is doable, but it's the transition that I'd really like to focus on today. How do we actually get there? How do we make the economics work in the short term? What are the policies that might be needed to get us through some of those stages? And from Air Liquide's perspective, you know, we've been in the hydrogen industry for more than 50 years. We have many, many uh, billions of dollars of assets in the existing hydrogen economy um, aimed toward industrial sectors, for example. How do we transition those assets? How do we build on those assets, build on and leverage the, the experience that we have in a way that results in the vision um, that we all share? You know, in, in the U.S., as you pointed out, Mark, there's more than 20,000 tons per day in production. Um, that's on the order of many tens of gigawatts of equivalent electrolysis production if we were to take those offline. And at what rate will these uh, become decarbonized? Do we displace them or do we decarbonize them um, as we go forward? And these are the real challenges that we're now faced with um, day to day in our, in our operating groups. Um, for Air Liquide, it's all about a sustainable transition. And sustainable means not just from an environmental perspective, but also from a societal perspective, and really from an economic sustainability perspective, because it's always in the US driven by 
uh, market driven and private investment driven transitions as we think about these kind of large scale energy um, transitions. How do we best use our existing assets and how do we decarbonize those? Do we use CCS, CCUS? Do we deploy renewable natural gas in our existing uh, steam methane reformers, for example? And at the same time, at what rate do we start to invest in electrolyzers to either displace those or be additive to the, to the um, performance that there, that's there? The new markets will drive that. The geography will drive that. The technology breakthroughs will drive that. If we think about the Gulf Coast of the United States, for example, where we have on the order of 50% of the US hydrogen production, tens of thousands of tons per day of production, if we wanted to displace that with electrolytic based hydrogen, where does the energy come from? Does it come from wind in, in the northern parts of Texas and other parts of the Midwest? And if so, how do we get it to the Gulf Coast? Do we bring it by pipeline or do we bring it by electricity and then produce locally? These are all the challenges and the questions that I'll bring up. I'm not sure we have the answers to all these questions today. And I've, and I've already seen a lot of questions in the, in the comment session asking about, you know, what are the costs going to be? What are the breakthroughs gonna be that are necessary to get us there? In a lot of cases, we don't, we don't fully know. And until we start to do things at scale and start to deploy them and start to get good information and find out where our limitations are, we, we may not know um, until we start to do these things at scale. For Air Liquide, we back up our, our vision with actions. We've got two big investments that are in the ground today. Um, we have in Becancourt, uh, Quebec, we have uh, a 20 megawatt electrolyzer operating on hydropower. It's produced uh, more than a, th a thousand tons of um, hydrogen to date. Um, all zero carbon going to our, our new energy markets. And then in Nevada, we have a new facility that'll be opening up in the next few weeks. Um, it uses renewable natural gas in, in reforming in order to produce uh, low carbon hydrogen for the California mobility markets, essentially. Uh, with that, I really look forward to the discussions and uh, look forward to another exciting year coming in 2022 for, uh, for hydrogen and its transition. Thank you, Dave. I, I appreciate the questions. And it's always good to have at least one unruly panelist who's willing to ask more questions than we have answers to. It makes it, makes it much more fun. So thank you very much. Um, we do have a few questions coming in uh, and, and some other ones I'd like to talk through. I think the first one, though, is more of a technical question that, that came in based on Kathy's presentation, noting that high temperature electrolysis and that it's mentioned in, in the, the bipartisan infrastructure law or the IIJA, uh, as, as other people refer to it. Um, what are the advantages of high temperature electrolysis compared to low temperature electrolysis? Or what are the niches where you see where high temperature fits better than low temperature? And then we'll get into some of these other uh, more philosophical questions, but a technical question to start us with. You want me to start with that one? Yeah, please, Kathy. Um, so I didn't go into the quantitative aspects, but it's really the efficiency of the high temperature electrolysis that is the advantage. So. Um, you know, it can be, I don't know the exact number, but um, probably 25%, 20% more efficient than the low temperature just because of the, the kinetics of the reactions at those temperatures. And so when you're thinking about uh, that balance between capital cost and operating cost, the high temperature systems could have an advantage there. Um, I think where it fits is where you already have the heat. Um, so things like nuclear, as Mark mentioned, mar marrying excess nuclear with uh, high temperature electrolysis is a pretty nice match in terms of um, the waste heat that you need to generate and also the constant baseload. Because as I mentioned, because they are so hot, they tend to be not very good with high thermal gradients. Um, and so that's, that's where I think the, the, the main advantage is. If I can add on to that comment, um, most of the nuclear operators who I talk to who are interested in hydrogen production are not really thinking about it as baseload. They're thinking about it as, as um, variable demand, a yep. form of flexibility. And so even in that use case, I think um, flexibility is, is a necessity. You know, otherwise, you're, you're really taking up the baseload production of nuclear, which is arguably its most valuable um, component in the production stack. So, you know, it's a tough equation to solve. Although I would add to that, working with some of the, the high temperature electrolyzer uh, development companies and some of the nuclear, uh, some of the nuclear operators, 
there's a lot of focus in how might they introduce that flexibility. And I think that the concept or that the base concept for that is kind of a hot standby mode where it's a minimal amount of electricity to be able to keep the temperature up. And then they believe that they can flex in, in similar ways. Now, I'm not completely convinced from a technical viewpoint. I mean, it's, a, it's hard enough to understand durability of some of those oxide electrolysis, uh, electrolyzers anyway. So uh, it, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. But it's, it's, it's an interesting opportunity, especially for a lot of these nuclear power plants that are economically challenged based on competing with natural gas and wind and solar today. So let's move into uh, a little bit more about markets and, and directions there. I mean, Rafi, you made the the, the argument that uh, fossil parity is where you need to be. And yet I hear from Dave in many ways that fossil parity may not be enough because you may not be able to get the right electricity at the right place, even if at, you're at off fossil parity, because if, well, you may not be able to get the electricity at a place where at the place where you can achieve fossil parity, where the hydrogen market might be, especially in the near term. I think we all agree in the long term, that's that's absolutely the ultimate way to get there. But in the near term, there's pieces along the way where it gets a lot of spatial challenges. Which ones do you think need to be addressed first in terms of those spatial challenges? And how might we move forward in terms of addressing, even if technically we can get the fossil parity, where, how do we get beyond uh, a, a paper study at fossil parity and into working equipment. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start it off and I'd love to hear Dave's um, views on this as well as Kathy's. But, uh, you know, from, from my point of view, it is, Mark, you framed it exactly right. It's a question of time. It's, it's a when, not if question. Um, because, you know, rewind 75 years, I could have asked the same question about natural gas conversion to hydrogen for use in uh, any number of applications, right? So you have to get the natural gas to the uh, to the uh, SMR plant, um, and we figured out how to how to do that, how to move natural gas around from from the wellhead through the midstream to the point of use. I think the same thing happens in hydrogen, but that's the long term view. Um, as Dave said, you know we have to chart a course from here to there, right? How do we get from where we are today to that future future state of a hydrogen pipeline and geologic storage system that rivals what we have in natural gas today. I mean, I think for me, that's an inevitability, but, um, but in the meantime, uh, I think we do have to focus on uh, moving electrons uh, because that infrastructure, at least at the scale that's relevant in the short term is readily available. Um, so decouple those two problems, right? If we're building hundreds of megawatts of electrolysis in the near term, and that's the problem we're trying to solve, then moving electrons is actually quite reasonable. If we're building terawatts of electrolysis in the distant future, pipelines are definitely the answer. It just takes time to get there. That's my personal view. Love to hear it more. No, no, yeah, I think I would just build on that. I think Rafi makes a really um, insightful uh, point about whether you're moving electrons or moving molecules and, and how that might transition over time. I like to think about the hydrogen economy um, in, in at least three different scales. The, the scale we're in today, um, everything is done locally. Look at your local energy. What resources are available? What feedstocks are available? What hydrogen production makes the most sense with that? what's available? And then what's the application space? Is there a need for transportation fuels? Are you displacing ammonia production? What is the, what is the application space that you're working in? And both of those are local uh, questions that you need to ask. Um, but over time, it becomes more of a regional um, question. You start to look outside of your specific location. You start to look instead of hundreds of miles, you might start to look thousands of miles. You start to move molecules maybe as liquid, uh, which allows you to move things further than you could before. And then eventually we get to a national scale. And at the national scale, you need to be moving molecules by pipeline. Um, that, that is not something we can do today. Um, we, we do it with natural gas, but we will need to be able to do it with hydrogen. We can also think, I suppose, about a fourth term where we're, we're thinking about hydrogen as a global molecule, and now it's moving um, either as a liquid or in, a, in another carrier um, around the globe and becomes a, a global energy um, commodity for us. Um, so for at least in the, in the short term, I think Rafi hit it right on the head that you need to look at what's available locally with the existing infrastructure. What can you do with what you've got? 
How are those investments going to lead you to this expansion in region? And then what are the overall resources that the US can deploy, that the globe can deploy to, to make hydrogen really part of this energy transition? I would also add that I think you have to incentivize some of that investment by proving out the technology, because despite the fact that electrolyzers have been around a long time, they haven't been at that industrial scale. And so I think Sanjay said it earlier, I mean, we just need to get going and actually building some of these in some of those niche areas where there are a convergence of, you know, utilization, renewable energy, et cetera, you know, like Houston, for example, um, where you have chemical industry and you have ac access to maybe offshore wind and you have access to pipeline. Getting a few big projects going so that there's confidence in investors to go ahead and make the commitment to do the rest is the starting point, I think. Yeah, I think Kathy makes an excellent point that in the end, it's going to be the economics that drive the rate of that transition. And economics are influenced by everything from policy to you know, existing challenges, to new challenges, to new technologies, to new investments. Um, but, but really, it's going to be the economics that determines where and how fast we can make that transition. And can we make the transition to scale that we need to be able to do? Great point. So, so another thing that drives economics, and Dave, I'll, I'll direct this question to you first, but then I'd love to hear Kathy and Rafi's comments on it as well. Another, uh, another piece that drives future economics is is near-term investment and lock-in. And the fact that once something is built, then economics start to be driven or it's cheaper to keep that operating than to build a replacement in, in many cases, or you've gotta be much more competitive to build the replacement. So the uh, the, the bill or the, the bipartisan infra infrastructure law uh, has $8 billion in hydrogen hubs, which I foresee in looking at your four different categories, Dave, as being the, one of the local area type solutions. How might DOE think about designing, say, an RFP for that or working with those, those hydrogen hubs, however many there are, four, six, eight, whatever that might be, so that they, uh, they prioritize or incentivize the opportunity to go from those local hubs to something more regional in the future or maybe even beyond that? Uh, what, how might those be set up in such a way to be able to build beyond or to be thinking in the designs beyond that first initial hub? Well, I think uh, my, my biggest suggestion is that we have a little bit of a mindset change on what a funding opportunity might look like from the DOE. This is a, at a scale that's entirely different. The outcome isn't necessarily demonstration of technology. It's demonstration of the economic viability of hydrogen in a market, which requires technology development, but it also requires a lot of other investment from production to distribution and also development of the, of the um, application. I think the biggest criteria for success for the hubs, the biggest measure of success should be, did it result in a viable market, a market that can grow, a market that's sustainable when the DOE funding goes away? Does it result in others adopting hydrogen into those markets? If the answer to those questions is yes, then I think the hubs will be a huge success because they will spur in a few years what might have been a decades long investment in the past. And it'll force projects to be much bigger, much earlier than we might have anticipated because the economics will work out. Those have to result in long-term sustainable outcomes. And it's the economic outcomes combined with the environmental outcomes and the societal outcomes that need to, all three need to be a success in order for the, in order for the hubs to be a, a successful program. If we end up uh, a few years from now and the hub monies go away and, and we've said, yep, we've demonstrated some new technologies, now we just wait for the market to take off, we, we probably are making a mistake. We probably haven't picked the right hub or the right hub projects, if that's the case, at least in my opinion. Kathy, Rafi, thoughts on the hubs and where where do we should be focusing with them? I mean, I, I agree with aspects of of what Dave said, and I, I would I, I especially think that creating the markets and and creating some surety around them is what's going to help the electrolyzer companies get the technology there. Because I would say, you know, I, I think Plug talked about this earlier. That's basically what happened in the the fuel cell fork truck market. You know, DOE helped to seed the market there. Um, that gave people the confidence to go ahead and invest. Because I think in a lot of cases, 
we know how we need to get to the cost reduction targets, but it, it requires a significant amount of investment and we need to know that that market's gonna be there to take up the product. So I do think that that's a very important aspect of this. Um, I also think we're gonna need to, to think about um, jobs as well. I mean, I, I think it was a little simplistic earlier to say that um, they're gonna be directly transferable. I think areas like these um, coal driven areas, um, it's going to be harder to think about. And that's something we're going to need to consider in the hubs as well, because I think they're uh, at least one or two of them is going to end up in one of those areas. So I think that's something that we'll need to think about too, is, uh, is retraining and how do you, how do you transition somebody from something like a coal mine to something like a clean technology? Nothing else to add, Mark. That's okay. Good no, is it that, that, that's great. So, so continuing on the discussion around creating markets, because I think that the the first uh, the first panel in this in today, uh, with uh, Sanjay especially from Plug Power, talked a lot about creating markets. But then I noted that his uh, his one comment for uh, a policymaker when asked, you know, what would you tell a policymaker is to create a production tax credit, which I would say isn't necessarily directly connected to creating markets it's creating opportunities for markets uh what would what would the three of you think that that first policy or that that policy might be to be able to create the markets is it reducing the cost of hydrogen through to production tax credit or other means or is it other types of incentives on more of the market pull side and i'll open that up to any of you or whoever wants to not step backwards the fastest uh -oh. right, I'll, step, I'll step into that one for from my perspective i would agree that a production tax credit um for a couple of reasons um the production tax credits um, at least some of the ways they've been structured in the past and the way that they've been discussed they are technology independent so it allows a lot of different um marketplaces to play in hydrogen production. It would encourage a lot of private investment into, into hydrogen production, things we don't see today. It would bring a lot of players into hydrogen production that we hadn't seen in the past because the amount of um, investment dollars that might be involved. And from all of those perspectives, what it does is it brings low cost, low carbon hydrogen into a market. And that allows people to adopt it more quickly. You can adopt it as a transportation fuel because the commercial adopters are going to have diesel parity earlier and at a scale they can they can rely on. And the other applications where you're doing natural gas displacement, it becomes an issue of economics at scale. And, and that's the number one thing I think that we could do from a policy perspective. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on this. Um, I mean, there's two approaches, right? You can reduce the cost or you can increase the price. Um, I'm no, uh, I'm not unfamiliar with the PTC and the ITC from solar and wind, and it's been it's been tremendously effective. But there's uh, there are also a lot of distortions that it creates in the capital markets that are really hard to get around. Um, and you know the 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 pool of tax advantage capital is not only a limited one, but it's it's a complex one, which um, which advantages certain parties over others. Uh, for for a lot of reasons, I mean, I, I think if if I had the choice of nothing or a PTC, I'd pick a PTC. Um, but uh, you know, ultimately, I think um, the I'm going to give the hard pat answer here, which is that we have to internalize the um, the cost of the externalities, carbon, um, more broadly, and and then let the market work it out. You know, the the PTC is a way of maybe stepping slowly into that or softly into it, but it's really not the perfect solution uh, to, to the problem in my view. Kathy, would you like the last word? <laughs> I don't know that I have that much to add. I do think that a, a production tax credit at the level that's being proposed would be game changing. Um, but I also somewhat agree with Rafi that you can't only rely on that either. Um, so I think there need to be other incentives as well, like, you know, de-incentivizing carbon production or however you want to state that. Okay. Yeah, one, one interesting point on, on this, uh, I think a previous speaker, uh, maybe it was Chris, made the point that um, renewable energy is far more capital intensive than, uh, than fossil energy. Uh, and so the tax, um, uh, the tax, the taxes that are involved in a project become a more significant piece of the cost of the energy that's produced or the product that's produced. 
And so, you know, that's that's maybe one reason why the PTC does make sense. Uh, but I would personally uh, ask policymakers to think about a more durable, not a not a, a short term, but a more durable um, approach to solving that problem. Cool. Thank you. Well, I. According to the agenda, we were supposed to end here, but I got a message asking uh, to continue with a couple more questions, meaning that this panel's answers are so insightful that we definitely want to ask a, a couple more things. Um, one of those is that the, the goal of, well, we've seen multiple goals for hydrogen, uh, $2 per kilogram in the bipartisan infrastructure law, $1 per kilogram in the, uh, in the hydrogen shot initiative. Um, and I'm just talking about electrolysis based hydrogen here, not uh, not many of the other options that are out there. And there, there's lots of discussion there. Are those goals achievable? And if so, what variables should be, what, what are the key variables probably in kind of priority order to be able to achieve to achieve $2 per kilogram and $1 per kilogram? And um, Rafi, I know you already answered part of this in the chat, so I'll turn it over to you to answer first. Yeah, I mean, my, my view of it, and there, there are different views, but my view of it is, is super simple. As Kathy said, um, energy is a huge part of the cost of hydrogen. And you know, even if you had a free electrolyzer plant, um, you know, $50 a megawatt hour energy isn't going to cut it. Um, and so first and foremost, we, we have to tap into an extremely low cost source of energy sub with the potential to go sub $10 a megawatt hour. Um, that is clean, green, and scalable, right? If we're talking about building gigawatt scale, many, many gigawatt scale plants, it's gotta be a, a new scalable energy resource because our grid isn't built to support a doubling of demand in order to offset um, you know, the, the thermal uses of natural gas and the chemical uses of natural gas. So we need really cheap energy that's scalable and clean. That's only one thing. That's wind and solar unfirmed. As soon as you try to firm solar and wind, the cost goes through the roof because batteries are expensive. So, you know, from that premise, the pressure now is on the cost of the plant, the electrolyzer plant. And, you know, everybody has a LCOH model. Um, you can run your own, you can run one of the, the ones that NREL produces, um, but the, the answer always comes out the same. You got to be able to build a constructed electrolysis plant fully commissioned for under 300 bucks a kilowatt. And if you can do that, then then those things, then the price point is achievable. And I'll take it you're optimistic that we can get there. That's what we're trying to do. <laughs> Any additional thoughts, Kathy or Dave, on, on that? I pretty much agree with what Rafi said. I mean, I, I do think that there are opportunities to get to those kinds of levels. Um, there's obviously work that needs to be done, both in technology and manufacturing. Um, but it all comes down to if you have that low cost renewable energy, then I think the pathway to the capex is is there. Especially if we're talking, you know, an intermediate cost of two dollars and then an ultimate cost within, I guess, nine years from now um, of one dollar. And uh, just as a general comment, I'll, I'll defer the, like the comments about electrolysis-based hydrogen production to Rafi and, and, and Kathy, as they've already um, answered it quite well. But keep in mind that the dollar per kilogram, the $2 per kilogram, isn't necessarily what the consumer is going to see. Because between that dollar and $2 production facility, you might need to liquefy. You might need to move it a few hundred miles. You might need a fueling station. There's any number of things in the, in the distribution network that can be additive to that and even potentially more costly than even a few dollars per kilogram. And so the picture that the, the problem that needs to be solved is bigger than just the one or $2 per kilogram. It's, it's the ability to execute that at an application space and be competitive at that point with things like diesel or natural gas or other energy sources. And that as a, as a combined system is, a, is equally large a challenge to, to getting the cost of electrolytic hydrogen down. Yeah, uh, 
definitely a, a good point, which leads into kind of the, the, the last question in the chat, which talks about integration between renewables and electrolyzers. And I know uh, Rafi made a really good point that in the near term, when you're only looking at uh, thousands of tons, uh, you're, you're probably looking at moving electrons, but in the long term, you need to be able to move, you need a pipeline uh, to be able to do that. Or maybe that was Dave that made that point. Um, what do you think about what are the what are the advantages of putting co-locating and co-connecting electrolyzers with solar and wind farms, and in what situations would that overcome the disadvantages of having to move having to move hydrogen instead of having to move electrons, which has a, a more built-out uh, infrastructure today? And I'll open that up to any of the three of you. I, I would comment that there's a bit of a land grab going on amongst renewable developers today who are looking at heretofore unviable sites for both wind and solar that happen to be co-located or continuous with rights of way, pipeline rights of way that exist. Um, and so, you know, people are thinking ahead on this problem, thinking to a time when those pipelines do get constructed and those pieces of property with very, very good renewable resource uh, can be constructed economically. So. You know, there, there's a lot going on there, um, kind of tying the two points together. Uh, I'll comment on the integra integration question. Um, you know, we've done a lot of analysis around the, the integration of solar, wind, solar and or wind and electrolysis. And um, there, there are really significant capital advantages to, uh, to be taken uh, through that tighter integration of the system. Um, but it obviously does put 100% the burden on being able to move the gas. And I would just add the word store the gas. Uh, there, there's an equally large challenge. Can you store on site if you're going to operate your electrolyzer in a periodic fashion and you have a liquefier on site? How do you merge those two without there being a very large storage between the two, for example? So it will be site specific and it'll depend on things like, are the, is there a pipeline available? Is there storage available? Um, do you need liquid? Uh, what is the distribution model gonna look like and how far away are your customers? So the answers to the question, will, there, will they be co-located? Almost certainly, will it always be? Almost certainly not. Good point. So it be, makes the project developer's job a quite a bit more challenging in terms of identifying and going through all those options to uh, identify what the best opportunity is for any given site or, or, or location. That's right, and the business model becomes more challenging because the value of that hydrogen is highly dependent on how successful you are in getting it to your customers at that yeah. appropriate cost. So mm -hmm. there's, there's entire aspects that, that change the game for how you would manage and operate an energy structure that has both wind, solar, and hydrogen than it was before when it was just wind and solar. And I think that may be the topic for a future discussion because I've got all kinds of purity <laughs> questions and things like that about how do we think about building an infrastructure to be able to achieve all of those, but not ones we can answer in our last minute or so that we have together. So I'd like to close by, by thanking Kathy and Rafi and Dave for really, really insightful answers, really insightful presentations today. I, I appreciate your time and I appreciate uh, all, the, all the work that you're doing in this space. And I Personally, I'm looking forward to working with all three of you as we move into 2022 and beyond. Thanks, Mark. Uh, great Thanks. panel. Uh, Kathy, Dave, and Rafi. Was, <laughs> I just learned so much from this panel. I, I love Rafi's uh, comment at the end about the land grab. <laughs> that's, that's, that's very insightful. Um, but going back to insight, um, and, and Frank, you may want to jump in here. Um, I thought that Chris had some really good insights. You know, he talked about the importance of speed and scale. You know, if we're going to get to net zero by 2050, we, we just got to step on the gas. And stepping on the gas, uh, I, I think, means government involvement. And, you know, this first panel that Frank shared um, about the strategy, I, I just think is critical because as Chris said, we, you know, right now we, we lack supply, um, we like to lack demand and we lack the infrastructure. And the only way, I mean, eventually this, these things will happen, but the government really has to have an outsized role here. 
And uh, you know, from what I'm hearing, you know, the uh, national hubs or the regional hubs, uh, big or small, are going to be an important part of the strategy. Um, Anybody else want to just jump in here in terms of you know what what was the most important thing that you heard today? Was it uh, do you agree with this comment about the supply demand and infrastructural lack in the U.S. and and the importance of the government? Well, it, you know I, I think if the government or maybe uh, Kathy was the person who said this that that it, that if the government starts investing, people will co-invest. That that's just life. You know if somebody knows is, is somebody else's money is involved, well then I'll put my money in, in there as well. Yeah, I think it's not only the co-investment, but just the the demonstration in a specific application and being able to look at that and say, okay, I trust this because I've seen this 10 or 20 megawatt demo or whatever it was, you know, um, say, I know already there's demonstrations going on with nuclear, for example, or I think there's a couple of other H2 at scale projects. And once the utilities are saying, yes, I've seen this plant on the ground, I can see it's working, then they're more willing to do a similar demonstration and then it kind of grows from there, I think. Okay, well, uh, I really want to thank everybody um, for participating today in this webinar. And we, again, we're going to come back tomorrow. Um, we're going to kick it off with Chris, uh, with Chuck McConnell giving a keynote address. And Chuck is, you know, is, you know, has, has really been in the industry for a very long time. He had a key governmental role and he's, you know, just full of war stories. I think, you know, the first 20, 30 minutes of Chuck speaking will be really fascinating. Then we're gonna move on to two different panels. Um, one on the, uh, the hydrogen economy, uh, again, maybe a, a broader perspective, which will be Q and A based like the first panel we had today. And then we're gonna go on to the tax incentives panel and given what happened on Sunday, um, that's going to be a very interesting panel because we're going to talk about whether or not there is a path forward. And you know that's the conversation that um, the tax people have been having every day starting on Sunday night. So with that, again, I want to thank everybody and I look forward to seeing folks tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Peter.